Okay, we're live. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Councilor Jennifer McKelvey. I'm chair of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum. So I'd like to now call meeting 30 to order. Welcome everyone. Today's meeting is being held with the members of council and city staff participating by both video conference and in person at City Hall. City Hall is open to the public and anyone is welcome to attend the meeting in council chambers today. The public may continue to participate by video conference. My apologies. Uh, may continue to participate electronically by video conference. This meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Infrastructure and Environment Committee's page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. If you are registered to speak at today's meeting, please listen for me to call your name. I will call speakers in the order they are on the list, whether they are online or in person. I ask for everyone's patience if we experience any delays or technical problems during the meeting. Members, the city clerk has provided all agenda materials on toronto.ca slash council and on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff will be available to members in the chamber and remotely if you need to help with your devices. Members, if you want to speak or question staff on an item, please get my attention on the mic so I can add you to the list of speakers. When voting on an item or motion, I ask the members to indicate that, that members ensure they keep their video on and raise their hand to indicate their vote. This is a paperless meeting, and I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at iec at toronto.ca to help with any motions. Although we are in different locations in meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflicts of Interest Act? If you do, please raise your hand and meet your mic and state the entrance. Councillor Cole. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to declare an interest on uh, item uh, IE 30.8 on the uh, blue box uh, agreements. Uh, uh, the uh, reason uh, for my interest is that my son uh, is employed by Ernst & Young, who is doing the study for the city on this uh, blue box program. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cole. May I have a motion to confirm the minutes of our meeting on April 26, 2022? Councillor Pasternak pardon, is Pardon me, Madam Chair. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, I'm, I'll, and I haven't filed the paperwork yet, but I will, I need to declare an interest uh, on item, um, sorry, on item IE 30.10, establish uh, authorization to establish an obligatory reserve fund for the Home Energy Loan Program with funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Um, I still have an outstanding um, a funding agreement with the City of Toronto for the Home Energy Loan Program that um, I don't think is impacted by this, but I don't know for certain. So I'll declare an interest. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, any other final call, any conflicts of interest? Okay, seeing none, uh, Councillor Pasternak has moved the, the minutes. All those in favor, all those opposed, the minutes carry. Um, we have 17 items listed on the agenda today, and Councillor Layton, you have new business to introduce? I do, if the clerk could put it on the screen. I'm not sure which item this is. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the infrastructure environment. Uh, this is on the report on pervious planting spaces on private property. Okay, so at this point, we're just going to vote to introduce that. All in favor, all imposed. That will be displayed on CMP so that we can review that and then vote on it later on. 
Okay, uh, so that brings us to the rundown of the council agenda. Item IE 30.1, amendment to purchase order number 605-2605 with Moose Power Incorporated for design and constru construction of solar photovoltaic rooftop systems. Um, would anybody like to hold this item? Okay, seeing none, would somebody like to move the item? Councilor Cole is moving. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. IE 30.2, amendment to purchase order number 6045927 for detailed design services for Shepherd Avenue and Leslie Street Sanitary Sewer Upgrades Project. Uh, would anybody like to hold this item? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the item? Councilor Layton's moving. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. IE 30.3, amendment to purchase order number 6045265 with Morrison Hirschfield Limited for professional services for Scarlet Road underpass bridge replacement and road network improvements at Canadian Pacific Railway Metrolinx Rail Corridor. Corridor. Would anybody like to hold the item? Uh, seeing none, would somebody like to move the item? Councillor Cole's moving. All those in favour? All those opposed? That item carries. IE 30.4, contract award for, of negotiable request for proposal document 31667738334 for construction of water mains. Would anybody like to hold this item? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the item? Councillor Pasternak's moving. All those in favour? All those opposed? That item carries. IE 30.5, contract award for professional engineering services to WSP Canada Incorporated, Ariba document number 31515395512. Councillor Pasternak wants to hold it. Okay. That item is held. IE 30.6, amendments to purchase order number 6042338 and 6042339 for project management and engineering services for the detailed design of the integrated pumping station at Ashbridge's Bay Treatment Plant. Uh, would anybody like to hold this item? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the item? Councilor Quill's moving. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. IE 30. Point seven Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy Final Report. Would anybody like to hold this item? Uh, Councillor Cole is holding. IE 30.8 Entering into Agreements with Producer Responsibility Organization for the Blue Box Program. I will hold as there are speakers and also Councillor Cole has declared conflict. IE 30.9 Ravine Strategy Implementation Update. I will hold as there are speakers. IE 30.10 Authorization to Establish Sorry. Um, okay, so 30.8 is held, 30.9 is held, 30.10, authorization to establish an obligatory reserve fund for the Home Energy Loan Program with funding from Federal Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Would anybody like to hold this item, 30.10? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Layton has turned off his camera. We'll do a recorded vote. Okay, uh, 30.10, all those in favour? Councillor Cole, Councillor Pasternak, myself, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes. In favor? And uh, Councillor um, Peruzza. Do we have Councillor Peruzza? In favor. In, in favor. Okay, thank you. Those are five in favor, and Councillor uh, Leighton can come back. IE 30.11, on-street electric vehicle charging stations, pilot conclusion and next steps, uh, I will hold as there are speakers on this item. IE 30.12, on-street logistics mini hub pilot on St. George Street, I will hold as there are speakers on this item. IE 30.13, Rockcliffe Riverine flood mitigation project municipal class environmental assessment. Would anybody like to hold 30.13? Seeing none, would somebody like to move this item? Councillor Pasternak, all those in favour? All those opposed? That item carries. IE 30.14, Sewers and Water Supply Bylaws 2021 Compliance and Enforcement Annual Report. Uh, would anybody like to hold 30.14? Seeing none, would somebody like to move this item? Councillor Cole, all those in favour? All those opposed, that item carries. IE 30.15, Western Waterfront Management Plan. I will hold as there are speakers on this item. IE 30.16, Interim Report for the High Park Movement Strategy. I will hold as there are speakers on this item. 
i.e. 30.17 single use and takeaway items reduction strategy voluntary measures program launch i will hold as there are items on this pro on this uh, sorry speakers on this item in ie 30.18 i will continue to hold just so we have time so that we can read that and we can vote on that one later as it was just introduced okay so that brings us back to um, the top of the agenda. So the first item held is 30.5 contract award for professional engineering services to WSB Canada Incorporated. Um, and Councillor Pastrnak, you held this item. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have some general questions about uh, how we pick uh, a company like this and what responsibility they have in rolling out the construction uh, at the ground level. So when we pick a WSP, they're obviously doing a lot of technical design, uh, engineering, and studies. When it comes to the digging itself, do they um, <coughs> supervise a company like GFL when it comes to rolling out their engineering uh, recommendations? Through the chair, Councillor, uh, you are correct and from the standpoint that the assignment itself consists largely of the detailed design, which is the front end piece, which then leads to the tender preparation, which uh, again, WSP is supporting staff. When it comes to the actual construction, once construction begins, WSP is also retained to provide contract administration services so on site inspection. But all the while, uh, our staff were involved, city staff, VCS staff were involved in the management of the consultants assignment and ensuring that the work is undertaken as per our requirement. So when it comes to actually doing the work, I, I, I guess I keep referring back to GFL, um, we, we select that company through our regular procurement and it's up to WSP for them to follow all the engineering and study guidelines? Uh, through the chair. So the, the contract, the contractor in that specific example uh, is still procured through the city. Uh, we city staff, ECS staff have overarching responsibility in the management of that, that uh, construction contract or that contractor. WSP is on site to ensure that the work is undertaken in accordance with our standards and specifications and as per or the, the design that they have prepared, but overarching responsibility still rests with the city. So when it comes to um, sort of problematic issues at the construction level, I'm, I'm getting a growing number of complaints about um, unjustified lane closures where the orange barriers are up all weekend long. There's no workers in there, there's no digging, uh, there's no equipment, and, and yet it creates uh, traffic bottlenecks. I'm also receiving a growing number of complaints of, um, I guess, construction in neighborhoods where, I hate to pick on GFL, but they're parking everywhere, they're blocking driveways, they're, um, they're, they're not respecting the local, local neighborhood. Is it WSP's responsibility to make sure they adhere to our rules of construction or is that a different team that would, that would go in there and investigate those complaints? Well, ultimately, it's, it's the city's responsibility, city staff. So if there are situations, just as you noted, the on-site inspector provided by WSP uh, would bring that to the attention of the contractor. If uh, there's unsatisfactory resolve of the issue, then it's escalated to our staff, and then we have an internal escalation uh, protocol. So if you have specific examples, we'd be more than happy to, to follow up with you and, uh, and that particular contractor or that particular construction project. So they would not they would not be in the the enforcement business to talk to the subcontractor or to the construction crews to adhere to city policy. That would still remain with us. The ultimate responsibility rests with the city. The, the on-site inspector provided by WSP would bring that to the attention of the contractor at the time of the infraction or the issue. But ultimately the responsibility rests with the city to make sure that the contractor is abiding by terms and conditions of their contract and whatever constraints that we have imposed, and particularly traffic restrictions as an example. Okay, okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions on this item? Okay, seeing none, any speakers on this item? 
I, I'm going to be very brief, I assure you. Um, so through, through my questions, I just want to elaborate a little more. The local councillors cannot supervise construction crews across the city doing major infrastructure work. Uh, while this infrastructure work is vital to the general operation of a city, uh, particularly in the basement flooding area where we're protecting homes, we're protecting businesses, uh, and these are, these are welcome projects, and we're very lucky to get them in our local neighborhoods. And, and I do tell uh, many of our residents who are encountering dust and noise and dirt and traffic uh, that, sure, there's, there's, a, there's a small price to pay to endure that, but at the end of the day, their home will be protected, their business will be protected, uh, and, of course, the neighborhood would be safer. At the same time, I think it's incumbent on, on companies that we're paying hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade our infrastructure to make sure that they respect the local community. It comes down to small things like, um, like the coffee cups thrown on people's lawns or the um, not adhering to our noise bylaw uh, regulations and uh, making sure that um, you know, they, they respect the local neighborhood even though they have to do heavy work and of course, lane closures, unjustified lane closures are an increasing problem. Uh, we uh, have experienced that uh, in many occasions where the orange barriers are up all weekend long, uh, where as I mentioned in my questioning, there's no, there's no workers uh, there, there's no digging, there's no equipment, and yet those barriers are blocking traffic flow. And of course, this has more serious consequences when it comes to emergency vehicles trying to get through on, this, on these traffic bottlenecks. Uh, yet we don't seem to have the resources to, to uh, warn these, um, uh, these construction companies uh, that unjustified lane closures uh, are unacceptable and that uh, you know an extra 15 minutes or 20 minutes on a uh, Friday afternoon to have the crew move the pylons off so that there's, um, so traffic can flow on the weekend I think is a very reasonable uh, request. So those are two things that uh, I just wanted to go on the public record uh, for, that um, um, these, these are uh, good companies that do great work for the City of Toronto. They make lots of money, uh, but it's the small things that detract from the good work that they're doing. Respect for the local community and making sure that any lane closures are justified. Thank you very much, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Any additional speakers on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, we can call the vote on IE 30.5. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. That brings us to the next item, IE 30.7, Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy. Councillor Cole, you held this item. Yeah, this is the Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy. Uh, I just, maybe I should hold it because I, I'm preparing a motion so let's hold this down till I uh, get a motion ready to deal with this, please. Okay, we can do that. Uh, the next item is 30.8, which is entering into agreements with producer responsibility organizations. So uh, you did declare a conflict on this one. Did you want us to, to hold it to the end or? Did which? You, the EPR one. The producer responsibility item is up so next. I've got a conflict on that. Yes. So yeah. I'm leaving the room. Perfect, yes. I want to know if you wanted to leave now or you wanted us to put it to the end and you could just leave it at the end. I'll leave now, I guess. Okay, perfect. I gotta make a phone call anyway. Okay, and you can get your motion ready. Okay, great. So, uh, Councillor Cole is excusing himself, so we can proceed with 30.8, entering into agreements with producer responsibility organizations. Uh, we have one speaker on this item, that is Emily Alfred. Emily, are you on the line? Hi, Emily, you have five minutes. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Great, okay. Good morning, councillors. Um, I'm here from the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Um, as you know, Toronto Environmental Alliance, or T, is an environmental nonprofit organization. We've been advocating for zero waste policies for over 30 years. I'm here to outline our concerns with the forthcoming Blue Box program for Ontario, 
the impact on the environment and share our recommendations for how the city can respond to protect Toronto's waste diversion programs. Last June, the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks finalized a new residential recycling regulation for Ontario, shifting responsibility for operating the blue, bin, the blue bin program from municipalities to the manufacturers and producers that design and put products and packaging on the market. This approach is meant to address the increasing cost of recycling in Ontario and address the recycling failures of increasingly complex packaging and products. While we support holding while we support the principle of holding producers responsible for what they put on the market, this regulation falls short. The new regulation has significant loopholes, low recycling targets and poor reporting requirements. And we fear that it will continue or increase the waste and plastic problems we currently face. In particular for Toronto, we're concerned that the regulation has low recycling targets, especially for plastic that are far too low to drive any real change to reduce or redesign packaging. Loopholes mean producers can actually increase their use of problem packaging like compostable plastics or non-recyclable foil pouches without any consequences. This will directly result in more garbage for the city to manage. The regulation excludes a number of Toronto's waste customers and provides only the bare minimum of education. Finally, uh, we're going to have a lot less reporting from this new regulation. Currently, municipal governments like Toronto provide extensive detailed annual reporting on all of the recyclables they collect. And we know that that level of information is not going to be available under the new system. These concerns have been well documented by T and other environmental organizations as well. Toronto Solid Waste staff have outlined a lot of their concerns that we share in this and previous staff reports. As the city prepares for the transition to the new system and negotiating the details with producer responsibility organizations, we have a few key recommendations for Council on how to protect Toronto's success in waste reduction. So number one, the city should continue to advocate to the province to fix the flaws in this regulation, to close the loopholes, to raise the recycling targets and to provide details on how the regulation will be enforced. Without fixing these flaws, Toronto's recycling rate will not improve and could go backwards. This will undermine our environmental progress and ability to achieve our climate targets. Number two, the city should retain as much control and a role in delivery of recycling services. Negotiate with the producer responsibility organization to do this. The city has decades of extensive experience providing waste services for Toronto residents, schools and small businesses. Maintaining the service delivery role will help avoid disruption or changes in service quality. Number three, the city should implement a robust, a robust monitoring program to track the rollout and impact of the new recycling program. For example, the volume of garbage the city is required to manage, the amount of recyclables in the garbage and organic streams, increases in litter or increases in illegal dumping. This information will be critical to a strong negotiating position and ensure that producers are held accountable if and when problems arise. Number four, the city should stay committed to providing waste diversion services to city customers that are left out of the new block, blue box regulation. This includes civic centers, shelters, libraries, community centers, small businesses and charities. Providing waste services to these, these groups of customers not only ensures higher waste diversion rates for our city, but supports important community services and small businesses that would otherwise not be able to afford recycling and organics collection. And number five, the city should stay committed to providing comprehensive public education on waste and diversion to Toronto residents. Toronto's waste education program includes an app, website, mail outs, 311, uh, in person events, training for multi residential uh, staff and residents, stickers and signs in up to 18 languages. The blue box, the blue box regulation, however, only requires that producers provide one mail out per year in French and English. That's just not good enough for Toronto. We urge the city to take these steps to proactively protect Toronto's recycling success and stay ready to uh, push our city to get even further in terms of waste diversion. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for joining us, Emily. Oh, oh Councillor Leighton, go ahead. For, my, screen, my screen froze for a moment, so a th thank you. Um, it, if I could, uh, what, what if we don't continue to expand our recycling uh, education and if the pros somehow are able to divert some currently recyclable material into the uh, the the uh, the garbage the landfill stream um, is the worry that that will actually increase the cost to the city. It could. 
So the, the, the point that I was raising or the concern that we have is that the regulation requires producers to collect a certain amount of materials that they put on the market. But the categories and the, tar the targets are low, so they don't, they don't have to collect every bit of you know, packaging or material they put on the market. They could also choose to use very hard to recycle things or non-recyclable materials that aren't in the blue box system. So like I mentioned, compostable plastics or stand up foil pouches that aren't actually recyclable right now. So if a company switches to non-recyclable packaging, they avoid some of their requirements to recycle that. They, re they avoid some of their, their tasks and costs at the, under the blue box regulation, but the city is the one that picks up the tab by having to collect more material. So this is why we have been advocating and we believe the city should advocate to increase the targets and ensure that if materials can't be recycled, companies should not be allowed to use them. So, so let me get this straight. Extended producer responsibility is designed to actually get, get packaging, get producers to reduce the amount of packaging, but there's an incentive for, uh, for these same companies that should be reducing to actually increase the complexity of the material and therefore send more to landfill. It's, it's the problem with the flawed regulation that allows these loopholes. So companies can pick up the easy to recycle stuff and ignore the hard stuff, which is going to be a problem for Toronto. And so, in the opposite direction, direction if, uh, if these producers decide they don't want to pay for their uh, the re, uh, re, our new recycling program and instead make more complex packaging. Can I can I get back to your first point around the city retaining the role of there are several different uh, pros um, that that exist, right? Mm -hmm. Each collecting a different a, a different type of recyclable material: glass, metal, plastic, correct, or more. I, I believe the pros will be um, are representing different uh, producers. So they will be collecting on behalf of those producers. And so they will be uh, collecting from different areas. I don't think, but you'd have to confirm that with city staff. They have a better understanding. Okay. But it's not inconceivable that all of a sudden we're going to have more. I, I think that's very possible if the city does not retain control. You know, the city right uh -huh. now has because trucks this... going down the streets already. It's an, it's an efficient system. And, you know, the city has the oversight and the experience on city streets. So that's because the city is always going to keep collecting organic. And uh, landfill or way the waste stream. We're always going to have mm -hmm. to have those weekly vehicles go down the streets. We're not about to switch to only once every two weeks collection of green bin. I can tell you that's not going to fly in most constituencies. Mm -hmm. um, so in, if the city isn't doing the collecting, collecting we're, we're going to have two sets of trucks going down at five o'clock on the afternoon trying to get those last bins backing up traffic on narrow streets adding to the number of vehicles that are congesting our roads like it's 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 perfectly likely that it will result in more trucks on our streets if if we don't play that role that, that's how I understand it. It would be would require another company to send trucks down Toronto streets to pick up recycling. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, questions of staff, and then I do remind members that there is a confidential attachment, so the city solicitor will give guidance on if those questions need to be in camera. Uh, Councillor Leighton. I'm going to guess that's my timer because I had my hand up. It just froze again. So um, I'm just going to get started uh, right away. One, because I don't think it's in the report, um, it, it might be. What are our current advocacy efforts to the provincial government to fix this, the, the regulation around extended producer responsibility? So through you, uh, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. Um, the city is taking a number of, of advocacy roles um, with direct communication to uh, our counterparts within the provincial government uh, with uh, interactions with local 
municipal officials and, and their connections and discussions with uh, their counterparts within the provincial government, working with uh, the M3RC, OWMA, and uh, a number of uh, other organizations across the province uh, to look at how to make the regulations uh, work and how to make the master service level agreement that was recently uh, proposed and, and put forward uh, work for the City of Toronto, but also the, the other communities that will be impacted by extended producer responsibility. Okay, that's good to hear. I, may, if I could make the suggestion that we're gonna have a really good opportunity when the government turns over and we have new ministers to highlight this point. And, and the earlier we do it, the better, because once we get a little further along in the transition years, it's gonna get trickier. Um, are you able to share the specific parameters that are being negotiated around the service agreement for the transition years and into the future? Um, through you, Madam Chair to the Councillor, that's included within the confidential attachment and any discussions on our bargaining position would have to go in camera. And we're not able to discuss the use of um, city infrastructure then as part of that agreement. So through you, Madam Chair to the Councillor, uh, we can discuss that, but um, that would have to be in it camera. It should be in camera. Yes. Um, may maybe you can ask, ask answer this, and if you can't, I, I, I fully respect that. If, if we're offering the use of some city facilities for, um, uh, to the pros, is that reciprocal? Because we're still going to have residual recyclable in our waste stream, for one, as well as, um, as was discussed by the previous speaker, so from uh, areas not that are, won't be collected from, and, and I assume we still want to recycle that material. Is that part of the discussion with the pros and the negotiation? So through you, uh, Madam Chair, I'm not quite uh, sure, Councillor, on the term uh, reciprocal. So we will be required to collect materials from approximately uh, 10 to 15,000 tons of our 180,000 tons of recycling material from uh, institutions that uh, aren't uh, eligible for extended producer responsibility. So we will have to have that program uh, maintained uh, by the city. But with your question on reciprocity, um, I just need a little bit more information on that. And it's probably best to, to go in camera to discuss uh, those types of confidential okay. terms. Okay, maybe you can ask me this, given, given that there's a, a position from staff around maintaining the service provider in the interim period, in the transition period, whatever you want to call it, um, is it still of our position that we would like to be the collector after the transition period? So through you, uh, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, that's something that the staff have not been provided direction uh, by Council on. Uh, we've sought the authority to negotiate up until December 31st, 2025, when full extended producer responsibility will be uh, across the province. What we will do uh, post the initial transition in July 1st, 2023 is return back to council and seek direction uh, from council at that time. If the city uh, wishes to maintain collection post 2026 uh, and, and work on any direction that's provided by council at that time. So will you be given giving us advice as to whether or not we should be the collector at that point in time? I'm just wondering, do we need a motion to, to ask for you to give us that advice or you will be giving that advice? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor, we will be providing that advice. Okay. Um, on, on the, is it accurate that, that the only education that the pros will need to do is, is an annual mailer? Um, so there's, uh, the requirements are outlined in the regulation and, and I have to ask Annette to, to, to jump in and go over those minimum criteria. but again, they're minimums and if the City of Toronto is to maintain that service, we would of course uh, maintain our, our public education and promotion activities that we do now. But in terms of that one specific mailer, I just have to ask Annette to, uh, or, or Charlotte, if, if they could provide some additional feedback on that one. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, during transition, uh, producers are required to continue services as currently provided. So during the three-year transition, they would have to continue on with regular P&E. Um, after that, uh, as the speaker said, uh, there is requirements on the languages and still having some materials to be disseminated. However, it is up to producers on how to meet that obligation. It's up to producers okay. entirely. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry, I can ask offline. 
Okay. Uh, additional questions on this item? Okay. Uh, seeing none, speakers on this item. Councillor Lee. Yes, I, I have a motion. I sent it to staff last week, but I'm not sure it looped back in. It was a it, it was to amend the confidential attachment with a couple of words. Does that mean we need to go into camera to I, it may be able to be public. So I, I circulated it last week. Uh, so they're still working on that. So maybe we can stand down this item and then come back to that. And it, can we just circulate on CMP and then members can look at it? Okay. Does that work, Councillor Lee? It's a very, very small, yeah, it's a very small language change to the final sentence of the report. Okay, and do you have any additional comments you'd like to make now? So then we can just oh, uh, yes. vote on the item later. Then we can just okay. do the motion. So you'll see why why my comments are relevant to the motion. But we this as you heard from the speaker, this continues to be a bad deal for municipalities, not just Toronto, but all across uh, all across Ontario. Look, extended producer responsibility was supposed to help us reduce packaging, give an incentive to producers by by putting an actual cost on the pollution that they're creating, the packaging pollution that they're, they're creating, and in, to ensure and, and give them an incentive to in fact reduce the amount uh, uh, of packaging. Think about it, when you buy like a, like a USB stick, not that anyone uses those anymore because it's all in the cloud, but you buy a USB stick, you have this big piece of plastic uh, attached to it. I see this too in it, like on the odd occasion that I go shopping at a, at, at, at a large uh, um, a large grocery store where you get like your package of hand cream in like a giant, plastic package that also includes paper and, or includes two different types of plastic. Can't be recycled, it's way in excess of what's necessary and presumably as a marketing, uh, as, as, a, as a marketing ploy or, or, or technique. In reality, you don't need even close to that amount of packaging. Uh, and in fact, uh, as we move forward and, 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 and grow as a society and an understanding of the impacts of plastic pollution, uh, we're seeing many, many producers switch out of plastic altogether and try to reduce as much both the packaging and um, what's necessary can, uh, to make sure that it can be recycled or, um, uh, or, uh, or reused. Um, the regulations as they've been presented in Ontario do the exact opposite. As you've heard, there's there's actually an incentive for producers to move toward non-recyclable complex packaging that, that is gonna end up in landfill. And who's gonna pay for that? You see, the idea of EPR was that producers pay for their, uh, their product and the entire life cycle of their product and the packaging of that product. Now, as it stands, it seems like if, if the producers go through a loophole in the regulation and make their material non-recyclable or, uh, uh, or, or, or don't want to reduce the amount of packaging that is coming in, then all of a sudden it ends up being paid for by, uh, by the city of Toronto uh, a rate base. Uh, and the same is gonna be true in municipalities all across Ontario. I'm really surprised, to be honest, that this isn't a bigger issue uh, on the AMO board, on, uh, uh, on our, our Ontario Big City Mayor's Caucus, that they're not kicking and screaming, saying like, you've taken a policy that was supposed to help reduce packaging, extend the life of our landfill, um, uh, uh, save us money and allow us to, to reclaim some of these resources. And you've, you've actually made it do the exact opposite. And in fact, at the end of the day, City of Toronto residents are gonna pay more for these, uh, uh, for waste collection. And we're gonna run out of our landfill, uh, space in our landfill fast, fast, faster. Uh, this is absolutely ridiculous. And then when you look at some of the uh, at, at some of the conditions on once it's fully uh, moved forward through uh, uh, and implemented, that there's no requirement for education. Think about that. Like like the entire basis of our recycling system and our waste reduction system is built on education, and they're talking about taking that all away. Like that's that, or, or at least or at least the pros don't have to deal with it, but the city of Toronto still does. And we still have outstanding, our community centers, much of our commercial and, and institutional, uh, all of these places that we're still gonna be holding the bag and driving trucks around to collect recycling, as well as compost and waste. Um, it, it's a terribly inefficient system, the way that it's been set up. What we should be doing is figuring out ways for municipalities to calculate the full cost of collection and disposal 
or uh, of, uh, of the various types of recyclable, the repurposing of the various types of recyclables and charging that back to these pros, the producers uh, that, that will be required to, um, uh, to, uh, to pay for it. Um, that's the way the system should be designed. We shouldn't let the private sector be entirely in the driver's seat here because we're gonna get a less efficient system with people trying to skirt the regulations and, and skirt paying their share uh, of the disposal costs of what will be more non-recyclable material ending up in our landfill. Thank you. Any more speakers? Uh, sorry, apologies. I'm speaking with clerks um, on your motion. Um, it's ready to be uploaded, but I still, I'm wondering if we should stand the item down so we can vote on it later because we all need to open it up in CMP and it won't be displayed publicly, right? Okay. So we'll hold, continue to hold this item, um, but I will ask if there's any other speakers on this item. Okay, uh, so seeing none, we'll come back to this. That brings us to 30.9 Ravine Strategy Implementation Update. Uh, city staff do have a presentation. It's about seven minutes. Uh, so I will pass it over to uh, Kim Statham to make the presentation. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, thanks for joining us, go ahead. I would just kindly ask the clerk if they can allow me to share content. There we go, thank you. And can everyone see that okay? Yes, we can, go ahead. Fantastic. Uh, good morning, Chair McKelvey, members of Infrastructure and Environment Committee. My name is Kim Statham. I'm the Acting Director of Urban Forestry. I am thrilled along with a huge team of city staff to present the first implementation update following the 2020 adoption of the Ravine Strategy Implementation Report. The report before you not only highlights the achievements on the advancement of the 20 short, medium and long term actions and several motions and directions to date, but it also makes two recommendations seeking council authority that will enable the team to deliver on key initiatives related to reconciliation and Indigenous engagement and next steps in Toronto's Ravine campaign. This is a high level overview of the significant progress made by the city and its partners by key program. Enhanced funding for invasive species provided increased management by staff, contractors and by volunteers through City of Toronto programs, which has resulted in a total of 720 hectares of land managed. We were also pleased to launch a pilot with a community organization called Toronto Nature Stewards uh, for community-led stewardship, and we are currently planning a program expansion for 2022. The establishment of a dedicated litter picking program to address litter and illegal dumping has resulted in 252 tons of garbage and metal to be removed from 333 hectares of land. This program is a critical component of the city's multi-pronged approach, which also includes enforcement and ed educational efforts. 42 students have been engaged through internship and training programs, that were delivered in partnership with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority and the community organization LEAF, ensuring Toronto's youth are connected to nature and have access to learn and explore future careers in the environmental, ecological and arboricultural sectors. City of Toronto programs, including 96 Ravine Day events and the Into Ravines program in partnership with Park People, engaged over 6,000 participants in virtual and in-person events, creating new community champions and opportunities to introduce Toronto's greatest natural asset to new people and communities. And finally, it is clear that multi-government support is crucial to achieve the common goals of Toronto's Ravine strategy, and since 2020, the city has commitments and submitted applications for a total of $47.9 million from federal and provincial governments to support its implementation. This is a breakdown of the funding programs, which reflect critical partnership uh, funding for capital infrastructure since the 2020 report to be delivered over the next eight years. The City of Toronto and Toronto and Region Conservation Authority is committed to the principles of the ravine strategy and recognize the value that our ravines provide for the ecological, 
recreational and health services, and resilience of our city. In 2022, the city plans to invest $118 million in Toronto's ravine system through operating funds and multi-divisional and coordinated capital works throughout the entire ravine system. But there is more work to be done, and the city has identified additional capital needs in the value of $148.5 million over the next 10 years. And this includes the $99.4 million specific to the 10 council-approved ravine strategy priority investment areas that are not part of the current planned investments. To be clear, the ravine strategy is not undertaken by the city alone. There is a robust model of collaboration and accountability that supports a coordinated delivery of capital and operational work, education, engagement and outreach, and community programming and activation. The ravine strategy implementation has benefited and will continue to be strengthened by divisional, multi-government, academic, youth, indigenous, community, and volunteer input, consultation, and delivery. In 2017, the city was asked to consider how a campaign could be developed to support and amplify implementation of the ravine strategy. And since that time, the city has launched and supported three components related to the ravine campaign. The first is the Loop Trail, which is a partnership uh, between the city, Evergreen, a Toronto-based charity, and Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, which will activate 65 kilometers of off-road multi-use uh, trails uh, that will connect multiple ravines, neighborhoods, and trail systems. It connects Rouge National Urban Park through uh, the Meadowway, which is a key project being led by the Toronto Region Conservation Authority and the Weston Family Foundation. Uh, the second component was the Into Ravines program, a partnership with Park People that has engaged more than 2,700 people over two years through community-led as well as self-directed and virtual events. Uh, the third component uh, was engagement with fundraising strategists, uh, which took place to ensure that the next phase of philanthropic work to support Toronto's ravines is coordinated, uh, thoughtful, and informed by a range of diverse partners. As a, a result of this work, the staff report before you includes a recommendation to explore a potential collaboration with the Toronto Foundation to advance ravine strategy projects and goals. Indigenous placemaking and placekeeping are important steps towards Indigenous self-determination, improved health and community well-being, providing access to ceremonial space and connection to economic opportunities. The city is committed through both the ravine strategy and the reconciliation action plan to incorporate indigenous knowledge in protecting and celebrating our ravines. The lodge on the Humber River is a place where many indigenous people and communities practice traditions and customs associated with their heritage and cultures. Many ceremonies and events have taken place in the lodge since it was constructed in the fall of 2020. Through the report before you today, staff are seeking authority to negotiate and sign in, uh, agreements with an Egby Indigenous, Indigenous Youth uh, Agency to explore opportunities for co-management of the space, supporting Indigenous inherent rights to access to land and water. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your time, support and continued interest in Toronto's Ravine Strategy. Thank you for your presentation. Six minutes, 50 seconds. You said you'd be seven. That was pretty on the ball. Uh, IE 30.9 again, just a reminder, that's what we're on, Ravine Strategy. We have four speakers. The first speaker is Ellen Schwartzel. Ellen, are you on the line? Do we ask questions of staff now or after the speakers? After the speakers. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Ellen. Go ahead, you have five minutes. Great. My name is Ellen Schwartzel, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Toronto Field Naturalists about Toronto's best remaining bits of nature, the Environmentally Significant Areas, or ESAs for short. For 10 years now, ESAs have been marked by lines on a map, and under Toronto's official plan, nobody is allowed to put buildings right on top of them. So far, so good. But the inconvenient fact is that ESAs are not protected in any other way from the rough and tumble of a big city. They can legally be dug up for sewer repairs and pipelines and transit and any other infrastructure. And they can be trampled by everyday uses, by foot traffic, by off-leash dogs, by informal trails, and they can be overrun by invasive weeds. And of course, all of that damage has been happening at an accelerated pace in the last few years, given growth and the pandemic. On top of that, parks managers and park staff sometimes seem to interpret ESAs 
as okay places for new trails, for routine lawn mowing, for nearby festivals or nearby dog parks or art installations. And that interpretation is a big problem. Some ESAs have signs, very few have fencing. The city promised in 2016 to put in place management plans for the ESAs. Six years later, management plans are still missing for most ESAs. We understand the city's planning machinery is now gearing up to draft those plans, but of course it will take years. So it's very late in the game. ESAs have endured years of deterioration. If we hope to have any natural heritage left to protect, the ESAs need quick measures now. And the Infrastructure and Environment Committee does have the power to recommend two short-term protective measures for ESAs until those long overdue management plans are in place. First, your committee can request that parks, forestry and recreation, the boots on the ground people, treat ESAs with care and protect ESAs from everyday trampling pressures starting right now this summer. ESAs should be clearly understood by all city staff as low traffic and tread lightly zones, small protected zones within the much, much bigger fabric of our huge ravine system. ESAs need sheltering and buffering from festivals, paved busy trails, dog parks, and public art. Second, your committee can also request that parks managers and staff be given a training session on ESAs, their locations, the unusual plants, the types of animals that can be found there, and the habitats that they protect. Parks managers can also learn and share advice on best management practices to keep those best nature bits thriving for the longer term. Your committee and park managers can lean on expertise and goodwill within city staff, among the academic community, and of course within Toronto's nature community, including Toronto Field Naturalists. We can all help in the conversation, but we do need to start that conversation right now. The conversation has been needed for a decade at least. It was in 2012 that the city first mapped out ESAs, and we now have 90 of these nature patches mapped out in Earth Official Plan. That map shows small patches along the shorelines and at places like Toronto Island, but most ESAs are in the ravines. And the ESAs, remember, they were marked out for two reasons. First, the land we call Toronto once had an astonishingly rich biodiversity, and we have a responsibility to keep the remnants of that wealth and pass it on to the future. Just as important, urban people do need nature nearby for mental and spiritual health. Nature is not a frill for a 21st century city. It's a key part of keeping a city livable in the best sense of the word. Urban people have a strong need for quiet, contemplative places where they can regroup and be restored. Peaceful places, not just party places. Toronto Field Naturalists have been connecting people with nature for 99 years now, and that gives us a long-term view. But we also have a very up-to-date view. Even during the pandemic, our volunteers lead six to nine walks a month in the ravines in all seasons. We see daily how nourishing and restorative urban nature can be for urban people. We've also been caring for Cottonwood Flats in the Don Valley in partnership with the city since 2017. We've also been showcasing ravines and urban nature with virtual outreach talks, reaching a combined audience of well over a thousand people in the last 18 months. And we do all of that without staff or grants. So we have a good overall sense of the value of nature to our city. So thanks for considering the urgent needs of nature in the city, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Ellen. Are there any questions for the deputants? Seeing none, thank you again, Ellen, for joining us. That brings us to our next speaker, Anna Meng, with the Toronto Nature Stewards. Anna, do we have you online? Um, Hi, Anna, you have five minutes. Oh, thank you. May I please ask for presenter abilities? I do. Oh, I do have, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. McKelvey, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Cole, Councillor Leighton, Councillor Minan Wong, and Councillor Perusa. I'm speaking today on behalf of Toronto Nature Stewards, and my purpose is to request that Urban Forestry review and approve TNS's planting strategy by July 31st, 2022 as part of the program of unsupervised stewardship. We urgently need to plant native species at our stewardship sites to fill in the gaps in the soils from our invasive removal efforts. My name is Anna Meng and I have been employed with TNS through the Institute of Forestry and Conservation at U of T since March of last year. And I'm currently working as their stewardship ecologist. 
In 2021, we had a very successful launch of the pilot program, uh, as mentioned in the Ravine Strategy Implementation Update. Um, apologies. Just Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties in sharing my screen. Um, could I please ask for, thank you, there we go. Apologies. Um, I will just continue on. And so over 1,600 volunteer hours were spent on the ground that were focused on removing 10 species of invasive plants. In total, we removed 420 bags of invasive plants from the nine pilot sites. However, the success and progress of last year's stewardship efforts could backtrack if we do not plant native species to fill in the spaces where these invasives were removed. As an example, um, at one of our sites in Roxborough, uh, we removed about 700 square meters of Japanese knotweed. After the stewardship effort, the patch of bare ground is now vulnerable to other nearby invasives, such as English ivy, uh, which are more competitive than man many of our native species. We've seen this same story across the nine pilot sites, and predictably we'll also see this in the new sites after a year of stewarding. TNS has formed a planting committee to research and review the best practices for sourcing and planting natives. Within the committee, there are master gardeners, experienced stewards and veteran naturalists. The committee has consulted individuals and organizations with experience in ecological restoration, plant propagation and native plants, such as the Society for Ecological Restoration Ontario, TRCA staff and researchers. In October of 2021, we've submitted a planting strategy to Parks Forestry and Recreation, outlining the criteria which our group will hold to and which aligns with current city policies to promote the use of local seed sources. The list of native plants we propose is extracted from the TRCA's list of flora species for entire TRCA jurisdiction 2021, which ensures that our plants are based on plant species which are indigenous to our area. Training for volunteers will also be provided. We are asking that urban forestry review and approve Toronto Nature Stewards planting strategy by July 31st, 2022, as we urgently need permission to plant native species in order to get our volunteers trained and coordinated for this fall's planting season. And crucially, before the areas that are now exposed become recolonized by other invasive species. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. I have a thank, question. Thank you. Councillor Cole has a question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your work on uh, yeah, was, uh, two trying to inform chair. the public about uh, the uh, proliferation of uh, foreign species uh, that are uh, blocking our indigenous species. Uh, uh, given uh, half the people in Toronto are have English as a second language, come from other countries. How are we trying to educate uh, and inform uh, these Torontonians about these uh, invasive species? How are you doing that? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we are mainly focused on work on the ground as a group. Um, and in terms of education and engagement, uh, the best way that we see to engage individuals is to get them involved uh, with stewardship. So get their hands dirty, get them on the ground uh, and learn through the plants themselves. Uh, so in order to do that, in there are many areas in Toronto with uh, underrepresentation in stewardship. Uh, we've worked very hard this year in 2022 to expand the stewardship sites to uh, certain neighborhood improvement areas. Um, for example, we have a site in Leaside and Flemingdon, um, as well as to uh, expand the geographical reach uh, to the more west areas of the city, north and east in Scarborough. Uh, and through that, we will through those sites, we will be doing outreach uh, at those sites to the community, 
uh, to try to get the community engaged with stewardship um, in their local ravine or natural area. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Councillor Cole. Councillor Pasternak has questions. Uh, great, thank you very much for uh, deputing in front of co committee today, and thank you so much to the Toronto Nature Stewards for your great work across across our city. Uh, one of the things we're looking at today is a staff report uh, that looks at um, TO Ravines micro grant recipients. I'm just wondering whether uh, whether Toronto I don't see on the list as a recipient. Did um, Toronto Nature Stewards apply for any of these micro grants? Uh, that are offered to groups? Uh, we did not apply to that specific grant, but we had applied to an invasive species center grant, micro grant um, and had been a recipient of that micro grant. So uh, we plan to use that to spend on tools and some plants uh, pending approval. Now, do you have the approvals you need? You mentioned the end of July you need approvals for planting, but do you have the approval for sites across the city for 2022 to do your work and to, to continue your work? Uh, thank you for that question. We have approval from our last year nine pilot sites and we are still in the midst of, uh, we are still waiting for approval for several of the sites for this year, but we have, uh, we have now over about 23 sites with approval. So. Uh, we have begun stewardship in those sites and we are still pending approval for several others. So with 23 sites, is, are you at capacity or could you handle more or, or is it a good next step? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. We, uh, we have increased our capacity greatly over the last year. Um, some examples of that include, uh, there are now two staff members, including myself. Um, we have streamlined a lot of the administrative burden by creating a, uh, hiring a web, uh, web designer to create a website. Uh, so that has greatly helped with the training and management of volunteers. And we have also streamlined a lot of the administrative uh, processes. So we are able to handle uh, the, all of the sites which we applied for um, in October of 2021. It's my understanding that uh, nobody goes into the woods in your group unless they receive some training. Is that is that still the case? So the training is for the lead stewards, which would be the the leaders of the sites, and the model is that those lead stewards are um, they they have been trained for two months uh, through online Zoom sessions and some on the ground field uh, field trips and. Uh, they are the ones who will then lead a group of up to 10 volunteer stewards per lead steward. Uh, so on the ground, the leads are the ones who have received training and in turn, they are the ones who give the basic uh, safety knowledge and basic training of plant identification and removal to, uh, to the other volunteers who choose to be involved, right. which we are calling. So just to reiterate, your teams will be out on about 23 sites uh, this, this coming summer? We are hoping to uh, get as many site approvals as we can, as we have uh, we have people on the ground who are behind each of those sites, um, people who love the these spaces and who have put a lot of time and effort into um, uh, creating a site plan and creating a plant inventory for them. Uh, but as of right now, we will be on the ground for about 23 sites, yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much and thank you for your great work. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Councillor Pasternak. Any additional questions for the speaker? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next speaker is Catherine Burka with Toronto Nature Stewards. Catherine, do we have you online? Calling again, Catherine Burka. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Hi, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, I understand that there's no visuals, so I have four slides, but I, I'm not sure if that's possible to um, to show. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Catherine Burka, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Toronto Nature's following Anna's presentation. 
We currently represent over 500 volunteers. Sorry to people. interrupt you, but you should have the ability to, to share slides. There should be a share button oh. available. Terrific. Okay, um, I've never done this before, so maybe I'll just pass. You can also submit them uh, to the clerk to be displayed for us uh, when the item goes to council. I, I did that. Okay, um, great. We can pull them up. Okay. Okay, so um, we represent over 500 volunteers and 57 lead stewards across the city in 17 different wards. And we're here today to ask staff to provide timely site approvals and to participate in a small collaborative pilot. The staff report states that TNS pilot had a successful inaugural year, but we do need to improve the program. This year, year two, site applications by candidate lead stewards and Toronto Nature Stewards were submitted back in October on the 18th. And we had no news of the two, 2022 sites until April 25th, when 13 sites were rejected and 10 remained under review. Not a single new site had been approved after six long months. Fortunately, we had a very late spring so that the invasive plants were still dormant, but our lead stewards were not. As Anna mentioned, they all trained over the winter months, looking very forward to spring and each putting in at least 10 hours of training, 10 hours of homework and three hour field trip. So training has to happen in the winter for stewarding to begin in the spring. And the lead stewards need to know that they will have a site close to home that they can steward before they begin training. Otherwise they won't put in the work or time. Um, we have 11,000 hectares of ravine land to steward and that's not including our other natural areas. 6,600 6, of this is public, as you know. TNS has asked for 145 hectares, and we've been given permission so far for 104 hectares. Um, the city, uh, is, according to 2020 published highlights, has in this release um, stewarding, which is close to about 2.3 hectares. And even if this number is, is incorrect, even if it's 100 times that, let's say it's 230 hectares, with our 104 and the city's 230 hectares, we're still a very long way off from 6,600. And we have to remember that TRCA gave us a D in biodiversity on our last report card, and nature simply doesn't wait for city bureaucracy. So it just doesn't seem right to us or to many people, uh, including our stewards, that dedicated and trained members of the public are turned away from stewarding because the current model lacks capacity, even though the land demands it. Every day we see people doing all kinds of destructive activities in our natural areas, walking dogs off leash, going up slopes, bicycles off trail, uh, frisbee golf, yet someone who likes to steward and heal this damage is denied so. If we increase access as the city becomes more densely populated, we really need to keep up by improving protection and um, helping with, protect, with restoration. Toronto Nature Stewards is bringing social capital and philanthropy to the table, both elements that are critical to the success of the Ravine strategy. And we really believe that volunteers should be working collaboratively with staff we propose a very small, simple pilot to demonstrate this. And unfortunately, I don't have a slide, but what we propose is that we just do one or two TNS sites of the 23 that Anna mentioned, that staff focus on cutting down the invasive trees that are larger than our permitted size of pulling, which is only one centimeter at, at breast height. And then staff apply herbicides to large monocultures that we can't really address. And that on the city planting sites, TNS tried watering, mulching, hand pulling of invasives around the new plantings. So we just want to try this and see if we can work together. We believe that we can get a lot more done working together. We can build trust and show that lead stewards and volunteers can be given certain responsibilities in our ravines, things that we cannot afford or expect city staff to do. Expanded stewardship not only means caring for the land, which desperately needs it, it also builds communities in each of your wards. 
It builds healthier people, both mentally and physically, and gets people outside. It's really a mutually healing process. So we hope that you'll support our request for, firstly, timely approval of sites to expand the program. Secondly, a small pilot to test collaboration for stewardship with the city. And three, an approved planting protocol. Thank you for your attention and your continued support of our meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Are there any questions for the deputy and Councillor Pashnak? Go ahead, five minutes. Uh, great, thank you. So year over year, do you think you've made um, some progress? Everyone's learned a bit, the city's learned a bit, you've learned a bit, and you see the, the program as an initial success? We do. And can't, are you, are you biting off more than you can chew or you're good, you're good with the current capacity? Well, um, that's a very good question. Um, we, we basically targeted for the sites that we applied for, so we can handle that capacity. What I think is really uh, deleterious to the program is that we have a few stewards for, um, well, some we had to move around, but we currently have four stewards who don't have a site. Um, and that's, I think, problematic. They put in 23 hours of time minimum and it's a shame that they really look forward to it and they're denied a site. So are you waiting on f approval of four more sites? We are, we would have liked to have had more, but we rejigged the people and, and they're moving a little bit north, a little bit west. They're um, maybe taking a pause, but we'll have to see. There was a little bit of shuffling around. A few people dropped out of the program because they didn't, um, they weren't allowed to steward in their neighborhood ravine. But we've sort of made do with what we have. Um, but I think we can handle a lot of capacity. I mean, this year we'll, we'll be able to tell. But it would just be nice to find a home for these four lead stewards who are waiting to steward. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your good work. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions of the deputant? If I may, I just have a couple questions, Councillor McKelvey. Yep. One on the comment that was just made about they weren't allowed to steward in their local ravines. Was that because the site was ruled um, un unacceptable or inappropriate, or was it because they just weren't getting approved fast enough? Uh, it's really hard to answer that, uh, Councillor Layton. I mean, initially it wasn't approved fast enough, and then we got basically all of our sites were, well, half, th 13 were rejected and 10 were under review and this is after six months and then when we did get the under review ones approved many of them had issues that there was conflicts with staff that this was nancy wetland that it was a place where there was archaeological remains um that there were places where there was uh, construction going on that there was a place where there was a summer camp going on so there were a lot of uh, reasons and we did a lot of workarounds trying to find and sort of find common ground. In some of these areas, we were successful. In four, we still remain unsuccessful. So the reasons are really wide. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we have, we, have, we had a pie chart to show you. There's a lot of ravine land that remains unstewarded. And it seems a bit uh, unusual that we can't find common ground and that we can't find you know out of the 6,600 hectares that we're arguing over a few hectares where we can't do any work i mean these are very simple workarounds and we propose a lot of these workarounds and i think collaboration is really the key to some of these because conflicts with staff i think shouldn't happen this this what we do and what city does is very different and i think that we need to find a synergistic model okay yeah, thank you Thank you, Councillor Layton. Additional questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you, Catherine. Our next speaker is John Bossens. John, do we have you online? Okay, can you uh, hear me? We can hear you. You have five minutes. Uh, can you see me? I'm just. Uh, you need to turn your camera on. I don't see on. anything on. 
Oh, sorry. How do I do that? There's usually a camera. I don't know which device you're on. Uh, if you're on an iPad, there's a. No, I'm on, on my computer, uh, which is a MacBook. There's usually a button. <laughs> Uh, but we can hear you, so oh, hear you. Um, sorry. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a MacBook, so I don't know what your icon looks like. So, but if you want, oh, we can see you. There you go. Okay, you, you have five minutes. You have me now. Yes, uh, we can see and hear you. Five minutes. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, I will also want to uh, share the screen uh, at a later point, but I'll uh, proceed without that for the moment. Uh, thank you for um, uh, for hearing me. I'm representing uh, the uh, Midtown Ravines Group which is a consortium of uh, eight residents associations in Midtown Toronto. And um, uh, we've been involved in, uh, in uh, trying to get progress in uh, improving and remediating uh, Midtown Ravine since 2016. The, um, I, I'm really here for several purposes. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, support the work that the uh, uh, Toronto Nature Stewards uh, are doing. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that uh, we believe that it's crucial going forward uh, that the city augment what it's able to do with its own resources, with its staff uh, and current funding uh, by also involving citizens uh, through which through the Toronto Nature uh, Stewards Program are being trained uh, to be effective stewards of ravine land. The, um, we have a huge job in Toronto's ravines. Uh, the, I, I want to applaud the fact that, uh, that the current city council made a decision in 2020 uh, to uh, proceed with a ravine strategy that uh, really starts making an impact in the ravines. But for basically a century, uh, or certainly for 50 years prior to that point, the city just let the ravines deteriorate. And uh, and that shows up in many ways. It shows up in the in the invasion of of uh, non-native species, uh, which the Toronto uh, Nature Stewards Program is uh, starting to deal with, uh, as is city staff. It also shows up in the amount of erosion uh, in Toronto's ravines. The uh, and I would like to uh, uh, actually at this point, if I may, share my screen. Um, can I do that? You have the ability if you can find the icon. Uh, share content. Probably. Okay, here we are. Yeah. Good. Uh, yes. Okay. I have just. I just want to uh, take a couple of minutes just to, just to show the, the amount of erosion that's taking place. Uh, I'm the the photos that I have here are just a small. Uh, small fraction of what I could show. Uh, but in the space of the, in the amount of time I have, I only wanted to show a few. Uh, here, I'm, this is a, a point in the ravine where there's an informal path on the east side of, uh, of the Yellow Creek Ravine, which is the ravine that goes from the Mount Pleasant Cemetery uh, down, uh, down to the uh, Don River uh, through Park Drive Reservation. You can see in that photo uh, a friend of mine standing beside a tree. Uh, the tree he's standing on a space that's about a meter away between the tree and the erosion that the red arrow is pointing to. Here is this. Here is the uh, view of that area uh, just a month later. Uh, in the inter inter in the intervening month, uh, a washout. Uh, one of many, I would say there are effectively about three to five uh, storms a year uh, where we have something like uh, 20 millimeters of rain in an hour, uh, which is enough to uh, basically take a, a stream which has maybe half a cubic foot per second of flow and under normal circumstances increase that to two cubic meters per second of flow. That's just in uh, what you might call a monthly storm or a bi-monthly storm. Um, the point is, is that, that that tree that you can just barely see on the left uh, has been, that path has just been washed out. And here we have the same view today of this, that same little tree. 
as you can see, the little tree is actually sitting in uh, midair. Uh, it's held up only by the fact that about a quarter of its roots are still in the ground to the left. Uh, and uh, we have probably one or two more streams before that goes along with the other trees that have already gone. In fact, since this photo was taken, the area that you can see, the vegetation, that's all being washed out by a, a storm that occurred about a month ago. Some other examples. So final, um, here, final example. thoughts? Yeah, that's fine. I'll just show you this quickly. Uh, former service row, um, a path that's caved in. I mean, there are many, many more examples. The point I want to make is that there's real urgency here. That nature does not wait. Uh, the, uh, it's really imperative uh, that the city proceed. Uh, it, it's, by the way, it's, it is planning, doing planning. It's hired a geomorphic consultant uh, whose, whose study conclusions we're waiting for. Uh, there's urgency here uh, because these, these streams uh, are being eroded. Uh, there are houses above that are being threatened. Some, uh, uh, some on Inglewood Avenue, some on Heath Crescent, uh, some on Summerhill Gardens. Great, thank uh, you. Uh, because the, there's just too much flow. And repairing tr Toronto's ravines is something that really cannot wait. We're grateful to the city for what it has done, but much more needs to be done. Thank you. Great, thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, just confirming those virtually, no questions. Okay, uh, that moves to questions of staff. Councillor Cole, I know you had your hand up right away. Go ahead, five minutes. Uh, yes, um, I was very uh, glad to see that there's a reference to the uh, Humber River and the uh, indigenous uh, uh, placemaking and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, camp that's there. Um, I was just wondering to staff, is this uh, the um, uh, the area you're referring to, uh, is this just uh, north of the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the, old, uh, the old mill restaurant there in Bridge? Is that the area you're talking about? The speaker, uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Cole. I'm going to ask Kim Statham to uh, answer. Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor, uh, the lodge is located uh, near Eglinton and em Emmett Avenue. Oh, and Eglinton and Emmett, because I think there's an informal lodge there just north of the, uh, the uh, Old Mill uh, Bridge and uh, restaurant. Uh, the other uh, thing is that um, uh, I'm just wondering, um, as you're uh, certainly recognizing uh, the uh, history and the importance of these ravines, and especially the one in the Humber River, I happened to be on it yesterday. And I wanna say it's, uh, it was uh, very pristine. Uh, the new uh, infrastructure work has been completed, the new pathway after, I guess it was about a two year project. So I wanna thank staff for that. But the question I had is, um, uh, you know, one of the persons responsible for preserving and establishing the Humber River as a national heritage site and literally putting it on the map was Madeline McDowell. Uh, is there any recognition of the work that Madeline McDowell and her mother before her, uh, Florence McDowell, did in terms of uh, bringing back the salmon to the Humber River? and getting rid of all the shopping carts and tires and garbage that was in the Humber River Valley for decades? So uh, through the chair, um, I, I do remember Madeline and, and working with her many, many years ago. Uh, through, through the program and the, what we'd like to expand uh, uh, related to the lodge at the Humber uh, is specific to, to a number of the indigenous communities and peoples that are, are using that now. Uh, but we certainly are working with uh, the uh, Toronto Region Conservation Authority and, uh, and you know, our heritage uh, partners on all of the work that is contributed uh, to, uh, to the Humber River, which as we all know is an important uh, uh, and recognized heritage river. But I, again, specifically, 
Have we, uh, I know there's a freeze on about naming anything, but uh, have we ever considered uh, recognizing the incredible uh, uh, work that uh, Madeline McDowell did to uh, bringing the Humber back to life? So maybe I'll just add through the speaker uh, to, to Councillor Cole. Uh, there is part of the ravine strategy is a long term uh, sort of signage and new wayfinding system that will also include some information, uh, you know, on on some of the significant uh, sites and some of the significant work that's being done. And I think uh, that certainly is the time to think about recognition of a number of, you know, local stewards and local contributors to the system. So it's a great suggestion. We'll certainly take it under uh, consideration as we start to develop that signage. Uh, and also we'll uh, think about it in relation to the city's new new sort of uh, commemorative uh, framework, which is coming forward in the next little while. Yes, and uh, keeping on the Humber uh, is, uh, you know, given this is uh, a foundational part of Canadian history where Etienne Brule uh, uh, first came uh, to uh, establish a presence here uh, and uh, the indigenous, uh, critical indigenous uh, uh, point that this was for their uh, uh, habitation and also trade. Uh, uh, is there plans to do even more education or recognition of the incredible contributions the indigenous uh, peoples made in this uh, Humber River Valley and especially down by the end towards uh, Etienne Brule Park? Gonna through the speaker to Kim. Through the chair, uh, yes, and I think uh, I think Janie's uh, uh, you know mention of the the wayfinding uh, strategy and our interpretation uh, program moving forward uh, can can certainly uh, look at the area uh, holistically uh, related to to the rich rich heritage uh, along the Humber. And what was the indigenous name of the river before we gave it this name Humber? Through the speaker, I wish I had an answer uh, to that. Uh, and if any of my uh, team members uh, uh, have that, and if they could, uh, uh, we might be able to answer that while we're in session. Uh, otherwise, uh, I certainly will uh, follow up. And may, yeah, may, maybe I can suggest uh, through the speaker, Councillor Cole, that we'll we'll get that information uh, and, and send it to you offline or before the meeting's over. Yeah, no, thanks. It just it just came up now since you're doing this and very good work in uh, including the indigenous peoples of Toronto in the uh, recognition of their presence there. Uh, I think uh, for our uh, self-edification and sharing with others, it would be great to know what the river was called before uh, we uh, came here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, additional questions, Councillor Pashnak, five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to staff, um, I guess if there's a there's a report here that also lists the uh, the micro grants, and I noticed that almost a third of them went to two wards. Was this widely uh, advertised across across all wards so that everyone had a fair fair chance to to apply, or how how was this done? Was there an equity lens? I don't I don't really see a balance um, in in the report you provided. Or whoever applies gets it, and if you didn't, then you 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 lose. So through, through the speaker, and I, I may ask staff to uh, to augment. So the into the ravines program, the micro grant program, is managed through a uh, a formal partnership agreement with park people, as the as the report notes. So they they uh, are responsible for the uh, for the development and the sort of um, posting of the opportunity for the grants, and I think they do that through a very very broad based sort of outreach through their website and through many of the sort of local organizations that uh, that they work with. Uh, so it wasn't an official posting through uh, the city's process, but. Certainly, Councillor, it's a great suggestion, and I think as we move into the next year of this program, uh, that's something that we can do is ensure that the opportunity is made available uh, publicly on the city's website, and also uh, we can send that information to councillors for posting in their own newsletters as well. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that, and I do realize that uh, groups do have to apply, 
uh, so we can we can take them to water, but they uh, they have to learn how to drink. Um, second question is: uh, Would you agree that volunteerism uh, and um, and sort of volunteer groups are a key part of our Toronto Ravine strategy? In other words, the city really doesn't have yeah, the resources or the budget just, uh, to do what we want to do in our ravines, and we're heavily reliant on on active groups like the Toronto Nature Stewards. So I'll, I'll just start and ask him probably to fill in uh, some of the blanks. But I, I and thanks for the question through the speaker to you, Councilor Pasternak. I, I just want to also thank the Toronto Nature Stewards for the work that they do and the and the information that they've shared today with the committee. They are a tremendous partner for the city, and we work collaboratively with them. It's a partnership that is growing, and I, I think probably um, because of some of the restrictions we had during the pandemic and during COVID. We're just now sort of getting into some expansions of the program. So they are a very, very valued partner and certainly a partner that in the future we plan to expand our work with as much as possible. Uh, last question regards is regarding small capital projects, maybe pathways, uh, small bridges over creeks, um, sort of resting areas, viewing points. How do we how do we take let's say section 37 uh, funds and apply them into our local uh, ravines and who would who would take carriage uh, of, of a capital project would it be our parks team would it be is there a ravines capital group how would that be done. I, I, through the speaker, I'll, I'll ask him to, to augment as well, but it, it, um, it, you know, any or all of the above uh, to answer your question. Uh, we do work in partnership with TRCA. We do some of our own work. We also, uh, um, you know, do work with uh, our, our capital group and with our parks group as well. So it depends on the size of the project, the scope of the project, the location of the project and, and some of those details. Uh, we certainly uh, are open to using Section 37 funds to advance any of those projects, and that can be part of the annual sort of meetings we do with councillors uh, who are interested in, uh, in using some of those funds that way. And I believe, Kim can correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been some Section 37 funds that have been focused on some of the projects in the last several years. Okay. All right. Thank you, Janie. Correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Additional questions, staff? Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first on the nature stewards to our, our general manager. Um, it does seem like a great resource that we, and, and it's, it's, I'm really happy to hear we're using it more. And it's not only like, like I, I'll just remark that this isn't about just improving our ravines and, and helping us out. Like the work that people do when they're uh, like forest bathing or uh, being out working um, uh, uh, with nature. Um, like when you when you when you build a tall building community at at we that we see around these um, uh, these uh, these ravines throughout the city, uh, giving people an opportunity to reconnect with nature is so critically important. And then when you talk about learning aspect, so all that aside, good 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 stuff. Um, I would say that um, it, like we've heard some concerns that the approval of sites is an issue. I understand, and perhaps you can talk us through there. There is a criteria for site. Well, what, why is it that it's such a challenge getting from like a criteria to an approved site? Is there a way for us to, for example, predetermine sites that would be appropriate and draw big circles around them and say, you don't need to seek approval in these sites. We have done it already. Um, or is there a, a need for us to revisit the criteria to be more permissive? So over to you, Janie and Kim. So through the speaker, I, Kim has, has been very, very actively involved in the selection of that criteria. So I'm going to ask uh, Kim to answer. Thank you, Janie. Through the chair. Hello, Councillor Layton. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, and, you know, and just to, to set the stage uh, as well, of course, uh, volunteerism is so important to our programs. Um, and and we, we are, uh, you know, pleased with the successful pilot that we've had with the Toronto Nature Stewards. Uh, we did develop criteria uh, agreed upon uh, between our two uh, groups uh, to pick sites uh, for the pilot as well as for the 2022 expansion. Uh, so we, the criteria uh, include um, things like uh, 
uh, choosing sites where we do not have active uh, you know, work either being undertaken by city staff or the city uh, volunteer, uh, the city's uh, program through volunteers uh, or contractors or our partners in the TRCA. Um, and, and we're looking for sites where we wouldn't, uh, of course, uh, 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 you know, have any issues with archaeological significance or the uh, ecologically sensitive areas. Uh, so so the, uh, the sites that, that we are uh, uh, looking at from TNS certainly have the lead stewards and the interest uh, from their volunteers, uh, but we're we're looking to balance uh, the, you know the work um, and looking to spread out that work, of course, uh, so that all of the programs are contributing to our common goals of community engagement uh, and invasive species management and land stewardship. So, is there a way to predetermine areas um, just so that we can avoid this conflict in the future? Like, I I hate to lose volunteers because. It took a little too long for us to make sure that the area is safe for people mm -hmm. and 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 nature safe from people, um, which I get, and and that's important criteria. Um, am I to take it that like perhaps we're moving more towards that model that we could have we we could avoid the conflicts that we're seeing that we heard about today? Sure, through through the chair, uh, absolutely. That's something that we'll look uh, toward doing in the future because uh, agreed, uh, having a more streamlined process uh, would be uh, critical for uh, maximizing the engagement of the Toronto Nature Stewards volunteers. Uh, to date, we've, you know, I would say we've been in more of a reactive mode, um, responding to sites where they have shown interest. Uh, so moving forward, that is something that we can put resources to. Uh, and so uh, in the future, I, I think that this is something that we can look at and maybe i can just add through the chair uh to councillor layton to kim's points uh again this this program is just expanding now and just starting to rapidly expand uh and i and and it's a very valuable program for us so i i think it's in everyone's best interest if we can do the type of work that you're suggesting in pre-selection so that there's less of a conflict between those sites and that we can move forward you know, and, and uh, access all of this uh, volunteer stewardship, which is so helpful. So uh, as we move into the expansion of these programs, these are all great ideas around how to, how to approach it in the future. So, so I have a last question about budgeting, because I don't see the number in here in, in the presentation. It, it may be in, in the report, but I just want a, a refresher. On the invasive species increased, we increased it over the, over the course of two years, correct? And that budget has been maintained, right? We haven't seen that's it. Correct. That's correct. Councilor. That's correct, Councillor. Kim, Kim uh, through, the, through the chair, Kim can share the exact numbers, but the budget has been increased over the last uh, few years, and we've maintained that in this year's budget as well. So the the next question is: there was a fluctuation, a dip in spending on litter picking in in ravines. Is that correct? I I seem to remember in one year we did an enhanced program that then was retracted. Is that this year? So through the speaker, there was an enhancement, uh, and Kim can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for one year, there was a one-time funding allocation, and then in 2022, uh, we returned to our base litter picking budget, which was a new item. I'd say three years ago, it was added That's into right. budget. Yeah, I, I just say like I asked because we're having difficulty this year with the coordinated um, uh, pickup, and we're we're now hearing from residents that. They're, they're noticing that it's 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 not the same level of service um, and like over the course of time it, it gets worse and worse and then all of a sudden there's a huge expense line because final people thought. are pulling vehicles out of the uh, out of the ravine that's that's my final thought thank you thank you and I, I will note that you had the previous speakers leftover time added on yours I forgot to reset okay uh, additional speakers on this item speaker sorry uh, questions questions of staff. Okay, I just have a, a couple quick questions. Um, so when we we sat down on this a couple of years ago and we said what the need was over five years, and um, I can see summarized in your presentation, you've made significant advancement on that, although we are still waiting to hear about the Natural Infrastructure Fund, the Nature Smart Fund, and the Active Transportation Funds. Uh, so my questions are, firstly, when do we think we'll hear back on those three funds? And then secondly, what is the remaining gap that we have for the next five years? So, uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to ask Kim on the uh, on the on the details around the, the actual funding details. But on when we'll hear back as soon as possible is the hopeful answer. Uh, I don't think we have a definitive answer on that. We have heard back on a 
approximately 19, uh, 18 million dollars of the of the 39 uh, uh, that is represented, or the 49. Uh, so uh, there is still some outstanding uh, commitments that we're seeking, and hopefully we'll we'll hear back as soon as possible. Kim can share some of the actual numbers around funded versus unfunded. Thank you uh, to the chair. So we uh, currently have um, uh, 148.5 million identified investment need over 10 years, and that equates to roughly 35.5 million over the next five. So, and for that 35.5, um, what years specifically? Because I know you have enough to go this year, next year. So really, is this looking at 2024 to 2026? That's correct. Okay. And so there is some urgency because, I mean, we can see uh, the Natural Infrastructure Fund was announced in, a, in the throne speech, uh, you know, several years ago and the money still isn't delivered. So really, if we want funding in two years, now is the time to advocate for that? That's correct. Okay. Um, thank you uh, so much for your work on this. Uh, we'll move to speakers. Councillor Cole. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman McKelvey. Yeah, first of all, I have a motion. Uh, this was uh, brought to my attention by the Toronto Field Naturalists, doing great work. A uh, city council requests the general manager of parks, forestry, and uh, recreation to affirm the importance of environmentally significant areas to ensure that the environmentally sensitive areas best practices are being followed to develop and implement appropriate staff training on environmentally sensitive areas, the ASAs as they're known, and request that the general manager of parks, forestry, and recreation to work with organizations such as Toronto Field National to develop this training. Okay, I think that's uh, something staff will work on, I'm sure. Uh, uh, as you know, in the past on this, Madam uh, Speaker, you've heard me talk about the uh, Norwegian invasion uh, and what's happening uh, to our city and our ravines. And, uh, but today I'm going to switch to another deadly killer uh, called the Japanese knotweed. So if we could put up a picture of this incredibly invasive and dangerous bully species that was brought here uh, as an ornamental plant in 1901, but it is everywhere in the city. In our ravines, it is choking uh, our uh, ravines. It is it grows through concrete. Uh, it is uh, again a real threat to uh, the integrity of our ravines, uh, backyard gardens, etc. So, one of the problems is that uh, the uh, public has no idea that this is a a bully species that can ruin uh, your garage, can do damage to the root of your house. Uh, and again, and it just overtakes all other species. I mean, this Japanese knotweed, uh, bugs won't even eat it. Uh, this is how deadly this thing is. And that uh, it also wipes out uh, other plant species where bugs can, uh, you know, feed off of, but not if there's Japanese knotweed. So, and this uh, species is also illegal in Ontario. You can't grow it, you can't import it, you can't sell it. Uh, it is an illegal plant, uh, and uh, yet it's all over the city of Toronto. And uh, we just have to do a better job of educating people about this. Uh, you know, from a glance, it looks harmless. You know, uh, a green uh, leaf uh, with, uh, there are flowers. The only thing you can do as a uh, layperson is at least maybe take and pluck the flowers off it so it doesn't uh, reproduce. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, it is, um, again, uh, one of these many invasive species. I don't want to go into the other ones, but today I just hope that we can share, and the Parks Department can share with the uh, community at large these uh, species which are just taking up the space that's available to our native species. Uh, and uh, but people tend to think, well, look at the beautiful uh, canopy cover in Toronto. Well, more and more of our canopy cover is basically uh, a Norwegian canopy cover. It's all Norway maples now that are pushing everything else aside. Uh, and uh, on the ground, we have this very, very uh, uh, dangerous uh, bully species, the uh, Japanese knotweed. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that. We need to try and do more to educate people on the need to eliminate, because once this knotweed gets into your yard, 
I mean, it is basically, it's almost immune from herbicides, from pulling, anything. Once it's there, you have a real disaster on your hands. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to do that. And I just want to thank everybody who's participated in uh, recognizing the importance of protecting our uh, ravines. As I've said many times in this council chamber, you know, the ravines are to Toronto what the canals are to Venice. Uh, and we have to appreciate them more. We have to let people know that they belong to all of us. And uh, whether it's litter picking or uh, essentially uh, ensuring uh, that uh, they remain uh, passive in use and, uh, and we allow, uh, you know, our birds and our bugs and our uh, uh, deer and uh, all of our other animals to basically uh, live there in uh, harmony with uh, those of us who uh, trespass there. So uh, again, I, I just want to thank uh, staff for all the work they're doing. They're really um, pushing the envelope on this. And I just think we've got to keep reminding people of how uh, wonderful and what an incredible asset we have to have these ravines throughout the city and especially in Scarborough. Some of the most unheard of, beautiful, uh, spectacular ravines next to Councillor Pastor. And I was in his ravines uh, yesterday off of Shepherd, uh, he's got ravines that go on forever there. Uh, but uh, Scarborough is a place if you want to see some beautiful, untouched uh, ravines that are uh, worth the uh, flight to Scarborough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, tours of Scarborough ravines are available anytime you want. Uh, other speakers on this item, Councillor Pasternak, five minutes. Yes, no, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, echo some of uh, Councillor Cole's uh, comments, although with all these invasive species and the way he talked about it, I'm getting more and more afraid to uh, go into our ravines as we may be attacked by uh, some of the vines that are, are growing. But uh, uh, kidding aside, our, our ravines are an extremely uh, precious resource. Um, they are there to enjoy uh, and protect, and I think that's the philosophy going forward, uh, make them more accessible, make them more inviting, uh, but at the same time, protect them. And I want to um, thank once again, the Toronto Nature Stewards who have um, boldly taken on uh, the uh, responsibility of uh, going into numerous sites across our city to, to help uh, fill the gap that we don't have the resources to do. And it's important to remember that the Toronto Ravine strategy is based very much on, on volunteer organizations and nonprofits. I mean, uh, we asked park people to, to uh, handle this grant program is from what I understand. Now, I think it needs a sober second look because as I mentioned in my questions, uh, eight, eight of the 29 grants went to two wards and having a ward with uh, a very rich uh, network of ravines, uh, we received, um, a total of um, um, zero uh, grants. So at the same time, in fairness, uh, our local groups do have to apply and they and if they don't apply, they're not going to get, but they also have to know about the program. And that's very, very important. Um, one thing we, we want to do in, in Ward 6 and in other wards is create a, a trail network and that takes some capital. Uh, capital projects, whether it's pathways or bridges or resting areas or viewing spots. And I realize uh, none of that comes cheap. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we want to see whether we can uh, leverage um, what is our Section 30 or Section 37 currently. Uh, but of course, in the future, it'll be the community benefits charge. Uh, but there are reserves there from, uh, from old Section 37 agreements uh, that will still be uh, available for uh, ravine capital improvements. So with that, I just wanted to thank staff for, for um, keeping this on the agenda. It's a crucial part of uh, how we protect our ravines and make them vibrant at the same time, let more and more people uh, enjoy them. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pasnack. Additional speakers, uh, Councillor Layton, five minutes. Much Chair McKelvey, um, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, I always say that, and it always is a five minutes. So um, I'll just say that I think there's a lot we're doing right here. I think there's some areas for improvement, but I think we're setting ourselves up to make the appropriate, take the appropriate steps uh, towards protecting this important 
uh, this important part of our uh, local ecological system, uh, both from an infrastructure standpoint, as was brought up by Mr. Bossens, uh, as we go through this hydrological examination or geomorphic hydrologic geomorphic examination of uh, several of the ravines that that type of work is going to happen all over now now the other is is uh, it, the increased investment in protecting the ecosystem from invasive species uh, and then generally just making the ravines tidier and, and, and cleaner as a result of some of the investments in in litter picking and then further the the sort of overlay of the recreational lens and the importance uh, as as councillor Cole put it so eloquently the importance of our ravines to uh, the well-being of people in our city. It used to be that our major parks were actually part of the ravine uh, system 80 years ago. Um, this is where families went to congregate, to picnic, and to do all those things. People still do today, but they've, uh, they've, uh, our ravines have run into some disrepair. And Mr. Boston so, showed some pictures of a ravine in Ward 11 um, that uh, has seen better days uh, and has seen a significant amount of downturn because of mostly natural but also there's a significant contribution um, to stormwater that uh, we're making upstream um, now there are solutions to all of these things uh, but they require investment and i think that's where we need uh, to strive to do better I I, I, I I demonstrated through my questions that while there was an increase in litter picking in ravines a couple of years ago we've actually seen some of that get uh, uh, get removed uh, some of that budget get removed and we're hearing about it like, i don't know about you but i'm getting a lot of calls about uh, concerns with the overall cleanliness of the ravine and the plastic uh, pollution that's ending up there, uh, the, the litter that's ending up there that ends up in our waterways if we don't do something about it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the staff for doing what they can to streamline this process of uh, engaging stewards. I think there's more we can do. I, I certainly would have hoped that, um, uh, that the door be much wider open to the inclusion of volunteers, um, but it does sound like we're getting there. And there are complications, of course, around safety and liability, um, as well as ensuring that the volunteers aren't doing more harm than they are uh, having a positive impact. And uh, I'm, I, I think we're, we're, we're going in that direction, uh, tending in that direction, trending in that direction. I, I do hope that staff are able to make sure that this particular year, uh, we're able to take um, a full advantage of those that are willing to put their time in, uh, into helping uh, get our ravines uh, up to a good standard. Now, I would say that, um, and, and just building on Councillor Pasternak's point, um, in order to get both the minor uh, uh, capital projects underway, but also those major projects, those earth moving projects, in order um, to protect the longevity of the ravine, uh, like the what we're doing in Yellow Creek, uh, we are going to require significant investment by every level of government, including this one. Uh, unfortunately, that's likely going to mean an investment well past what we're able to do through community benefit and through uh, and, and through Section 37, uh, partly because uh, the the intensification of communities and 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 so the the community benefit concentration of of those dollars isn't limited uh, or or is very limited compared to the the vast expanse of uh, the ravine system that we have in the community, and it shouldn't depend on it. Uh, it, it frankly simply shouldn't depend on whether or not you've got tall buildings going in the neighbor, neighborhood if you're gonna uh, keep those uh, ravines up to um, uh, uh, up to a certain standard and so we should be looking for additional resources i know we've gone to the federal government provincial government um, but honestly um, those resources are are, are 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 very small compared to the overall investment that's needed into the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in order to address our uh, the pressures on our ravine. I would say that uh, that, that some of this should fall on Toronto water, um, and uh, and the work that TRCA does because these uh, these ravines are first and foremost an ecological green piece of green infrastructure uh, that we will need in order to address flooding issues all across uh, the the city of Toronto. And so I hope in future years we can have very serious conversations about how we're gonna how we're gonna fill that gap uh, in the capital improvements that are necessary for the ravines. In the meantime, let's continue to rely on stewards and make it easier for them to make their contribution and, and have their hard work pay off. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Additional speakers? Okay, uh, I just have a few remarks. Um, firstly, I just really want to thank staff for, for all the hard work that they've done. Uh, we all know that the ravines were a forgotten place um, filled with litter, filled with invasive species. 
um, they weren't animated spaces for people and uh, they weren't really contributing the full amount that they could to the ecological integrity of our, our ecosystems. Um, staff have done an ecological valuation. We know that these ravines provide $822 million of ecological benefits annually. That's the amount of money we would have to spend if we did not have them for those good things like carbon sequestration, filtering water, um, et cetera. Uh, we have ambitious plans in the City of Toronto. We are remediating priority areas that have been plagued by erosion. Uh, some of that work is well underway. Uh, we have increased the amounts of funding that we're putting towards litter and invasive species. And you can see uh, some of the highlights include uh, 720 hectares that have been managed for invasive species. Uh, 252 tons of garbage have been removed from 333 hectares. Uh, we've put 42 students to work um, to clean up these systems as well. And on top of that, we're looking to build a 65 kilometer loop trail in the west end of the city and a 16 kilometer trail in Scarborough that will connect the Don Valley to uh, the Rouge Park crossing many ravine systems. And that of course is the Meadowvale Trail. And we are making investments that get us there. Uh, $118 million this year is what the city is spending in our ravine systems. And we are starting to look at them holistically. So we're all working together uh, to make progress. And that also includes working together to make progress to close the funding gap. And I do want to recognize the significant contributions that we've had from our other levels of government, in particular, the federal government, which even created a fund, the Natural Infrastructure Fund, uh, through a throne speech a couple of years ago uh, under the leadership of Catherine McKenna. And in that throne speech, it specifically mentioned the ravine strategy as the type of project that should be funded through this. And of course, we are working to continue to, to secure that $20 million that has been uh, designated to the city of Toronto. But we do need to all work together to, to secure the remaining funding, which we've heard today is $35.5 million between 2024 and 2026 for our capital funds. And of course, we can't forget the two actual recommendations that are before us today. And the first one is to look at how we can engage our partners, uh, how we can work together with the private sector to um, and work with the Toronto Foundation to animate these spaces to raise those much needed funds. And of course, uh, the second recommendation before us, which I think we're all whole, whole, wholeheartedly in agreement with, uh, with, which is building on the city's commitment to reconciliation and developing uh, Indigenous placemaking and placekeeping spaces. So uh, a big thank you to everybody. We do have more work ahead. A thank you to the citizens as well, the nature stewards that are doing their part uh, to invigorate these spaces as well. And uh, with that, I am sorry I did not turn on my timer, but if there's no additional speakers, uh, we can vote on this item. So all those in favor? Oh, uh, sorry, we are going to start with Councillor Poole's motion, which I just want to flag, there was a minor change to the wording on it so that it's City Council that's endorsing that as opposed to the General Manager. So Councillor Cole, if you just want to have a look at the first line. So it's City Council affirms the importance of the environmental significant area. Okay, great. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, that carries. Uh, we'll vote on the item. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, the Ravine Strategy Implementation Report passes. Uh, good work, everybody. That brings us back to the agenda. Uh, our next item is the on-street electric vehicle charging stations pilot conclusion and next steps. Uh, we have one- Madam Speaker, if I, or Chair, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I sent you a text a message just because I no longer need to move a motion on the EPR motion and yes. uh, EPR item. And that means that Matt and Solid Waste can probably go about their day. Uh, we need to so go on camera, so I was going to do it at 1230, unless we can just ask uh, okay. Councillor Layton, uh, sorry, Councillor Cole, do you just want to leave the floor for a minute? Okay. okay. If you just give me a minute. Okay. Uh, so that brings us then, we will uh, jump back to IE 30.8, entering agreements with producer responsibility organizations for the Blue Box program. I will move the supporting report. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. And then on the item as amended, all those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. And we can call Councillor Cole back. Okay, thank you, Councillor Layton, for that. 
Um, so back to 30.11 on-street electric charging stations. Our first speaker is Brian Purell with the Atmospheric Fund. Brian, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, Councillors. My name is Brian Purcell with the Atmospheric Fund. Uh, we are a public agency that invests in climate solutions across the greater Toronto Hamilton area. And um, I want to start today by congratulating uh, the city and staff on the success successful completion of the on street charging pilot uh, and the encouraging results we saw with uh, strong utilization growing over time and, and reaching or exceeding the ideal range of, of use of these. Electric vehicle chargers that uh, that we want to see. So uh, a really successful results. Really pleased there. Also want to applaud uh, the city and staff for uh, setting a target of adding 32 more chargers this year, uh, exceeding what council requested for 2022. Uh, great to see that uh, that momentum um, and uh, critically needed. Uh, and my message, really, my key message today is that we need to continue building that momentum. Uh, we're at a critical phase in uh, the advancement of electric vehicles and electric transportation in Toronto. We have uh, some enormous progress we need to make to hit the city's 2025 and 2030 targets for EV adoption as part of our net zero strategy. And uh, and so we need to continue that momentum and growing the, the size of this on-street charging and um, infrastructure and other uh, locations for chargers as well. Uh, we just wrapped up a survey with uh, over 1200 Torontonians on electric vehicles and charging um, and some really promising results. 81% uh, of respondents were strongly interested in considering uh, an electric vehicle for their next vehicle purchase. Many of those purchases they reported would be happening in the next three years. Uh, but we found uh, about a third of respondents uh, did not have access to a private garage or driveway that they could use to install a home charger. And 76% uh, and said they'd be far more likely to, to consider and buy an EV if um, there was a convenient charging within a five minute walk of their home. So that uh, is really critical to many Torontonians to enable them to adopt EVs. And um, and meeting uh, our EV targets, uh, citywide targets for 2025 and 2030 as part of the net zero plan, we believe, and we've, we've sent some information that this requires, uh, this will require about uh, 500 on street chargers by 2025. So some significant work left to do to get the level of infrastructure on the streets that will enable uh, those who don't have access to private home charging to, uh, to adopt these vehicles and help the city reach its climate goals. Um, so uh, our one concern is that there are currently no plans or goals for 2023. Uh, there's a planned transfer of responsibility for, for on-street charging from Transportation Services and Toronto Hydro to the Toronto Parking Authority. But there is no uh, plan or resources in hand uh, for Toronto Parking Authority to uh, install any additional uh, on-street chargers in 2023, and they're not currently planning to do so. Uh, and so we're concerned about this because we don't want to see this great momentum grind to a halt in 2023. Uh, we need to, to, to have 500 in place by 2025. We need to continue building that, that momentum and seeing a larger number of installs uh, each year. Um, and uh, there's lots of federal funding available to support this uh, rolled out of infrastructure. And uh, the city hasn't yet been getting as much as it should have that. Uh, the next round of federal funding uh, under the ZVIP program closes August 11th and on street charging is eligible. Uh, but the city is not currently planning or working on an application for on street charging as part of that uh, round. So the sort of risk will lose out on that funding for 2023 unless we can move forward with a goal and uh, and have clear direction to expand that on street charging network uh, moving forward into the future in 2023 and beyond. Uh, there's a citywide charging infrastructure strategy that uh, Environment and Energy Division are working on, which is great. Uh, be another year or so until that's ready, and that will have more detailed targets for on street. But we can't afford to just take a year off uh, while we wait for that. We can't afford to skip 2023 if we're going to stay on track for those 2025 targets. Um, and so our recommendation is simple that uh, there should be a target for 2023 for expanding the on street charging infrastructure and build on the success of the pilot. Uh, we'd suggest, based on our, our citywide goals, that the target for 2023 should be 100 uh, new installations of uh, electric vehicle chargers on street, in addition to the many other locations that, uh, that are being worked on. 
And that keeps us on track for that 500 or so we'll need by 2025. And relatedly, you know, we should be uh, integrating that into any applications to the, to all eligible federal and provincial funding programs, including the one coming up this uh, this summer. And um, that's really encapsulates what I wanted to say. Again, a great job by staff in completing the pilot and identifying the immediate growth uh, this year. Uh, let's keep up with the momentum in 2023 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move to questions of staff. Questions of staff. Councillor Leighton. I have questions. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Um, just, uh, there is no target this year or for next year. What, why is that? Uh, through the speaker to Councillor Leighton, uh, this program is completing the pilot right now and we have uh, a target for uh, this year of uh, 32 additional stations. Um, we also have a couple reports that are coming in the next cycle that are going to really articulate how we're going to strategize and work through the partners because this is a partnership program to um, to pick up some steam. Um, so uh, Energy and Environment and Toronto Hydro and uh, our, our partners at TPA are going to be uh, making this into a regular program that Im implies that we'll be going for additional rounds of federal funding that we'll be looking to see um, how what bylaws we need to modify in order to have more opportunities for on street, et cetera. So I think you'll see that in the next couple of years, as we get all that sorted out, we will in fact have more ambitious targets. I see James is on the call. He may have some other thoughts. No, Barbara, I think you covered most of it. We're also, as and I think as uh, the deputy from TAF noted, uh, putting together a, a more uh, comprehensive EV charging uh, implementation um, plan and doing some work on that this year. Uh, and that will also inform upon targets as, as well as uh, funding requirements. That being said, in the interim, we are continuing to work on on uh, installation um, uh, and uh, and seeking funding where possible. We've recently struck a group uh, working group across uh, all the city divisions and with our partners uh, to provide a more coordinated and uh, and collaborative approach to that. Is there someone here at the TPA who can talk to us about as we transition towards the TPA what what their ambition is on the file. I see Jeffrey, Jeffrey. Through the, the chair to the counselor, thank you for the question. Um, you know, put simply, we don't have a firm target for 2023 at this point. Um, I do wanna provide some context with that though. TPA's EV charging program is currently focused on our off-street parking facilities. And we've got an ambitious target of installing 250 EV chargers before the end of next year, uh, 500 by the end of 2024. To put that in perspective, we have nine chargers in operation right now. We'll be at over 100 by the end of this year, and we'll continue to accelerate delivery of the program with the sense of urgency that is is really needed here. And while the initial phases of our charging program are already in flight, the on-street EV charging phase is, is still under development at this point. Um, there's a couple of things that we're gonna need supports on to really get this moving next year and into 24 and 25. Um, the first is that we need direction from the on-street EV charging needs study that our colleagues at Energy and Environment will be leading. Uh, this study will help define how many chargers are needed citywide and where they should be located. And while completion is expected next year, which will help inform what we do in 2024 and beyond, we still need to figure out where to focus our efforts in 2023. Again, keeping in mind that TPA is planning to install approximately 150 chargers in its off-street parking facilities next year. The other support that I'll highlight uh, is that TPA and, and city finance need to take a closer look at TPA's net revenue share agreement with the city to ensure that TPA has access to the right retained earnings it's going to need to advance the on-street EV program. We're more than happy to deliver uh, this program on behalf of the city, but it does introduce new operating and capital pressures that need to be accounted for in the revenue share agreement that we have in place. 
while at the same time not compromising the other programs that we're responsible for. Uh, lastly, I would just mention that we're going to need to build out a team so that we have the right resources to go as fast as the city wants us to go. We'll, we'll address this as part of our 2023 budget proposal, but I do want to flag the importance of having the right team with the right competencies to drive this program forward. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. D. Um, I just have one last question. I see my clock's not going, so I'll just ask one more. H how long was it between the target being established it, for this year and the and and sort of the full installation like what's the what's the what's the lag between us setting a target and implementing the the, the remainder of the program or a, like like powering up the last charger barbara do you want to take that one um you know, we're all kind of waiting for the other person to take that one uh <laughs> I think, uh, Councillor Layton, what we've learned through the pilot is instrumental in helping us to be able to move more quickly in the future. Um, when we came back with our initial report, we anticipated we'd be able to get 17 in. This year, uh, we've we've been able to, to nearly double that. Um, part of it is finding the appropriate on-street spaces. So once we have the bylaws sorted out and we understand where we can actually put these uh, chargers, the technology piece, I think, certainly is a critical issue. Um, the partnership with our colleagues at Toronto Hydro has, has certainly improved. They have um, good uh, leadership on, on the file. And so I think we will find that uh, into 2023, we're going to need a little less runway uh, than we do. And I also think that um, what we're learning is that not it, there's probably a little bit more consultation that might be required for, for some streamlined implementation as well. And so I think the group needs to take that back. And the value of having this working group struck is that we have the ability to, to tackle these things uh, proactively. So I think a long-winded answer of saying, yes, it's taken a while to get us where we are now, but that none of that um, information has been lost. And we hope that we can shorten the runway to get installation accomplished according to a more aggressive schedule. I, I didn't hear a timeline, but but <laughs> I heard a good explanation. Okay. So thank you. Uh huh. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lee. Thank you for um, respecting that. I forgot to start the clock on you and being kind about that. Uh, any additional questions of staff, Councillor Pasternak? Five minutes. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, when we do a, a development application, we require the developers to put uh, usually some car share, uh, some cycling infrastructure. Uh, other public realm amenities. Um, I've seen these, even in these reports requiring them to provide uh, presto passes, uh, but I never really see them requiring developers to to put in uh, EV um, charging stations. And I'm I'm trying to go through the report to see uh, where that may be a requirement and whether that's been explored uh, by staff. Or is that a planning? Is that a planning? Um, through the chair, Councillor Pasternak, maybe it's Greg, or maybe I can assist. Uh, through the uh, green development standard uh, uh, that is applied in all the development review that we do, uh, there are uh, minimum requirements. And as we've enhanced the green development standards, those have been increased over the years. Uh, I believe, and I'm going by memory, I don't have it in front of me, that we have just increase the uh, the uh, requirement through the new version that's, a, that's applicable as of May the 1st, including uh, making sure that all parking in, in buildings is EV ready. Um, but I have to look it up specifically. I just don't have it at my fingertips to, to respond. So, so currently it's, it's not a normal requirement to planning staff to expect a, a developer to include EV stations uh, either I mean, I realize this is um, this is looking at on street. Um, <laughs> there are streets surrounding new developments, and of course, there's underground. But currently, there's no requirement of that. Is that would that be well? well again, again, Councillor, uh, the private parking that is provided in buildings, uh, and I'm speaking of residential right now, uh, would there would be EV ready. Uh, uh, Capability in in the in that in those buildings going forward, um, the the uh, it is part of the zoning 
changes that we, we typically put in place. Uh, but if a building is commercial, for example, and there's a commercial garage, uh, that is not something I believe that we currently require, but it may be something that commercial developers are including, whether they be in underground garages or, or surface lots. Uh, but it's to date, it's a more of a market driven outcome and not a city requirement that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, now I'm looking at your map on page nine. I notice all of the um, charging stations expected in 2022 are south of Eglinton. Um, what are the plans to, to bring uh, these initiatives into the uh, inner suburbs where um, use of motor vehicle is actually more intense than in the downtown? Thanks, Councillor Pasternak. So um, through the chair, the project that we, the pilot that we did was was definitely in neighborhoods south of Eglinton. Uh, I think we went to look at some of the areas where we had um, certainly on-street parking, uh, where there's many neighborhoods in the city that don't actually have on-street parking in the suburban parts of the city. So that was part of it. Um, there's a fair amount of demand in, in a number of the neighborhoods where we have implemented the pilot because they uh, actually don't have necessarily uh, driveways or uh, other areas suitable for charging. So we took that on first. Um, I think as the program expands, we're certainly happy to look at, at opportunities where there is on-street parking in some suburban communities to see if that would be appropriate. Um, and so we can certainly take a look at that in the, on the go forward. And, okay. and my might add, uh, Barbara, we are doing, uh, Council, we're doing a, a public EV charging infrastructure plan uh, in 2023 looking to report back uh, kind of Q2, uh, sorry, in 2022, looking to report back Q2 of 2023, and that will look uh, kind of citywide at uh, charging infrastructure uh, opportunities, uh, both um, uh, on street and beyond in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, new installations. And I think we can also take your question, Councillor Pasternak, about the, um, the private development and what's requested required as part of green development standards and, and be, have more fulsome responses in in that report as well. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Additional questions of staff? I have some questions. Um, what will we be seeing in the next report that comes before us at IAC? I believe we have a electric vehicle update that will be coming forward uh, to the next IEC. That will provide uh, an overview in terms of where we're at in, ter in, in terms of the implementation of our overall electric vehicle strategy. Um, so it will look at uh, the various components of that strategy, including uh, charging, um, how, uh, how the targets, uh, progress towards those targets citywide, um, as well as how those targets are, uh, are impacted by uh, the recent changes um, on, in terms of timelines to get to net zero under Transform TO. Uh, we'll also be providing an update on, on other areas such as education and outreach um, and other partnerships and work that we're doing uh, across the city, uh, including such as our, our fleet uh, adoption as well as uh, charging for uh, uh, at, uh, at other sites uh, across the city, uh, including with uh, the, the work we're doing with the Toronto Parking Authority. Okay. Um... Uh, to General Manager of Transportation, uh, you've seen Councillor Matlow's letter. Uh, he he would like to defer two of uh, the charging stations at 39 Cuthbert Crescent. If we do this today, can you work with other councillors in advance of the next meeting to recommend an alternate location that we so that we can still hit our 32? Um, uh, to you, Chair, we have been doing some initial assessment of where we could make up those two spaces because we are uh, interested in, in hitting that target of 32. So we will um, we will do that work and we'll do our best to uh, to find some additional spots and we can certainly report back on our success uh, or, or what the challenges would be in doing that this year. Okay. But that's our intention. Let's try uh, to make that happen. Will the next EV report outline the structure of this working group, who's on it and uh, how it's functioning? Yes, and I, I think it's um, uh, one of the reasons why we had to bring this report in advance of that one, because I really don't want to confuse people on that, is that we actually needed some bylaw changes that are necessary to do through the Toronto East York Community Council, and so we would not have been able to affect that for this year if we had not come uh, with this early report on the pilot completion. 
but um, certainly the working group and the structure of who's in the lead and what are, are the roles and responsibilities, um, who's managing the policy aspects of it, who's going to deliver on the operations, uh, all of that will be articulated in the report. Okay, and so potentially will that report also outline goals going forward um, in terms of numbers and moving forward to hitting our net zero goal for 2040? I think we have options to do that. We can do that in the next report. Uh, certainly Toronto Hydro is coming back with their climate action plan and that will also have uh, some ties to that. And then as James mentioned, we also have the report next year that will be the broader strategy. So. Um, James, I don't know if you wanted to add anything about your thoughts related to targets and, and when we'll be doing that in this next report or the one in 23. So I think the next report will talk broadly about kind of the updated targets um, based on the Transform TO uh, from a kind of a, a, an overview perspective in terms of the specific targets. Um, that will come in the 2023 report after we've uh, completed our, our EV charging infrastructure plan. Um, so we will have some additional information coming in the next report in July, but kind of the more detailed information will be part of the uh, uh, the 2023 report. Okay, uh, quick question, Toronto Parking Authority. You've seen uh, the motions by Councillor Layton. Um, are you comfortable with hitting those targets for next year? I am comfortable with hitting those tar targets, uh, subject to the right supports being in place. Okay. And then the last question I have is, uh, when is the next intake for the zero emission vehicle infrastructure program by the federal government? Uh, and are we working on a submission? I believe the deadline is August the 11th and we will be uh, making a submission on behalf of Toronto Parking Authority, which we will coordinate with uh, our colleagues at E&E &E and, and transportation on as well. Okay, great. So transportation, e and &E, you'll also be looking at that for on-street and other opportunities for the city as well? Yes, I think as, as part of the working group and as part of our broader electric vehicle working group, we'll be coordinating um, across the city in terms of any uh, funding asked from the federal government. Okay, great. Uh, that's it for my questions. Any additional questions, staff? Okay, uh, seeing none, speakers on this item. I know Councillor Leighton, didn't you have motions? Yes, thank you very much. If the clerk could put it on the screen. Also try to find it in my email. The City Council requests the Board of Directors of the Toronto Parking Authority to work with the General Manager of Transportation Services, Toronto High, and relevant stakeholders to install a minimum of 50 on-street electric vehicle chargers by the end of 2023. City Council requests the um, Executive Director, Energy and Environment Division, and President Toronto Park and Authority to report back on the results of the EV charging needs study in 2023 and identify the number of on street electric charging, uh, electric vehicle chargers that will be installed through 2024 2025. City Council requests the Board of Directors of Toronto Park and Authority to request the TPA Board to accelerate the installation of on street electrical uh, vehicle chargers by prioritizing existing pay and display locations. City Council requests the Board of Directors, General Parking Authority, to request the President TPA to identify it in its proposed 2023 operating capital needs uh, and, and capital plan the operating, including staffing and capital budget require, uh, requirements needed to support the operation, maintenance, and continued expansion of EV. And finally, City Council direct the, the CFO and Treasurer to ensure the City of Toronto Parking Authority net income revenue share agreement provides Toronto Parking Authority with sufficient retained earnings. Uh, to fund the incremental cost uh, associated with the expansion. Sorry, and finally, City Council requests um, General Manager Transportation Services and Exec Economic Development to work with TPA to provide annual updates to City Council beginning in the fourth quarter of 2023 uh, on the installation of on-street and off-street electrical charging uh, facility stations. Uh, understanding that we're going to get a report later this month um, about an update on the city-wide uh, EV strategy, um, there's a big hole here in the next couple of years that um, we have already identified that um, the TPA will, build, will be the city agency that will be rolling out the uh, on-street uh, electrical vehicle um, um, uh, program for the city that we're far behind on and other, municip other municipalities are, are, are ahead of us. We are making up ground. I should first say that thank you to all staff involved in this report, like going from zero to 60 
like if you're a cyclist, you know, uh, get getting your 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 early momentum is the most difficult part of your ride. And so I'm really happy to see that we're coming out of the gate strong here. Uh, TPA is as well with, as you've heard, a very aggressive uh, expansion of uh, of off street uh, in facility electric vehicle charging, which is sort of the, the, the lower hanging fruit here, albeit it's, it's, it's difficult work to get it uh, approved. Um, but, but when you look at the ground we need to cover, there's likely no target too high here. And I get that like, we want them geographically distributed properly as, as Councillor Pasternak uh, insinuated, but we're gonna need a lot and everywhere. They're in, these are incredibly difficult to cite. If we're not working, uh, this year to site next year already, then we will fall behind in our in our target. That much is clear. If the report comes back and says we need to do twice as many next year, then so be it, and and I'll be ready to move that motion. Um, but we need and and I, I like I I I firmly in are in agreement with uh, with um, with the Toronto Atmospheric Fund on this that we need to start. Uh, getting out ahead of this and setting our targets in advance. We can't wait till January to set the target for 2023. Um, we simply, we, we will be lining up ourselves for failure. The TPA don't have an on-street target yet because they are not currently in the business of on-street parking, but we know they will be because that's where it's trending towards. That's what we've asked staff to sort of hand off that, that program to them. So let's give them a, a, an early target that we know will probably be not enough, but certainly, um, as you heard from uh, from the TPA today, is 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 a doable number uh, for for them with the necessary supports in place. And some of those are outlined. I've worked with staff on outlining what some of those supports might look like in order to ensure they can pull it off. Um, I guess everyone didn't think it was a, a, a natural fit for me to fall on, onto the TPA board. It didn't feel like a natural fit in my first meeting. Um, but I, I, the, the challenges that uh, Councillor Bradford and I put forward about moving the TPA into the business of electric vehicles has certainly paid off. And we've got a, a agency ready to take on this work in an aggressive fashion. And I think we need to give them the right tools to do that, starting with a good, uh, a good target to set us off right. Um, but I am, if, if that target needs to change as a result of what we hear from staff, so be it. I just wanted to make sure that it was a doable target but also one that was better than this year. Okay, thank you, Councillor Layton. Other speakers on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, I have a motion that I agree to move on Councillor Matlow's behalf, uh, that City Council requests General Manager Transportation Services and Executive Director Environment and Energy in consultation with Toronto Hydro Electric Systems to postpone the planned installation of two electric vehicle chargers at 39 Cuthbert Crescent pending further consultation with local with the local councillor. Um, and I do this because I am confident that there are other locations and other councillors that are looking for EV charging stations this year and that we can accommodate these. Um, sorry, I will reset. Uh, I also want to uh, echo Councillor uh, Layton some of his comments, um, in particular about setting a goal for 2023 early. I'm hopeful that we will do that by applying uh, to the a zero emission vehicle infrastructure program in August. Um, I also want to thank TAF uh, for their work in advocacy on this item uh, and uh, just again underscore some of the results they said uh, in a survey of a thousand residents they found that 81% of Toronto respondents want their next vehicle to be an EV. I'm one of them uh, and 30% of respondents don't have the option to charge mine at home. I'm very fortunate I can charge mine at home but I appreciate that uh, this is a big challenge for us as a city and we need to uh, do more to accommodate this transition. Uh, so with that, seeing no additional speakers, we'll vote on the motions first. So on Councillor uh, Leighton's motion, all those in favor? All those opposed, that carries on my motion, all those in favor? All those opposed, that carries on the item as amended, all those in favor? All those opposed, that item carries, and we will have more discussions about EV uh, EV charging stations at uh, next month's IEC meeting as well. Uh, that takes us back to the agenda on item 30.12, on-street logistics mini hub pilot on St. George Street. We have one deputant, uh, Dr. Judy Falbold, Fal sorry, Farvolden at the University of Toronto Mobility Network. Um, Dr. Farvolden, do we have you online?
I, yes, I'm here. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee for providing me with this opportunity to speak to you about the matter of the on street logistics mini hub pilot on St. George Street. So, as you said, I'm Dr. Judy Farvolden. I'm the executive director of the University of Toronto Mobility Network. When I last had the opportunity to speak to the committee on the release of the freight and goods movement transportation strategy, that was October 2020. And I was speaking on behalf of the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute, which is named in this item as a partner. Uh, but a year ago, U of T acknowledged that the equitable and sustainable movement of people and goods is among humanity's grand challenges and designated U tree as an institutional strategic initiative rebranded as Mobility Network. It's just rebranding, we're still U of T, we're still transportation researchers, and we're still keen on collaboration and pilot projects with the City of Toronto, which brings me to why I'm here to talk about this matter. I really just want to add my voice, that is our voices, um, to the group of people in support of this opportunity. I don't need to tell you you've been living it, the staff and councillors at City of Toronto, that we live in an age of disruption. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted mobility patterns in ways that we don't understand and they'll reverberate for years to come. We're still finding out what it means. We have technology advancements that are radically changing our mobility patterns and the demands on our streets. Think sidewalk, delivery robots, and yet we have to make our streets safer, we have to make them more equitable, and we have to meet the climate crisis. And all this while, as, a, as the pandemic ebbs, we are reminded that the Toronto region has to continue to prepare for growth. So the St. George Mini Hum Pilot Project is one of 24 projects in Clue, City Logistics for the Urban Economy, a five-year research project funded by the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Candidates, led by Matt Rurda, involves 10 researchers from U of T, McMaster, and York University. Transportation Services is participating in several clue projects that align with freight and goods movement strategy, uh, its vision zero strategy, its commitment to emissions reductions, you just talked about that, and congestion management goals. On this item, um, it's one of these projects. So, and the, and the mini hub supports the goals and represents progress towards three of the seven recommendations in the freight and goods movement strategy. So two of these are, it will test the value of allowing motor assisted bicycles to have heavier throttle operated electric motors. And two, it will explore business arrangements with courier companies to pilot the use of pickup and drop off locations in repurposed parking spaces, in this case on St. George Street. So Pure Later Courier is gonna replace delivery trucks in the study area with these newly enabled e-cargo tricycles operating from the micro hub on St. George Street. The study area goes from Bathurst in the west to Bay on the east, Bloor in the north, and College on the south. And U of T is facilitating by providing power for the hub and leading the collaborative research project. Over the course of the 18-month study, Clue researchers are going to collect data on the package deliveries, electricity charging demand, the routes used, the parking tickets received, and monitor the pilot project for performance cost, safety, sustainability against goals of the cities, and interview the, the participants, the peer later truck and e-cargo cycle deliveries, the, the mobility hub staff and others to see what their experience was of this exercise. It's an excellent example of university industry government collaborative pilot studies that enable us to uh, saw, look at novel practices. In a planned and controlled way, the results in evidence that can inform future decision making. And again, the city has great, had has great success in this in the past. I always point back to the King Street uh, transit pilot study as one of those great pilot studies. And here's another opportunity. Pure Later wants to deliver more efficiently and sustainably um, with reduced pedestrian conflicts, that's back to safety, traffic, park traffic parking, that's tickets, and traffic impacts, that's congestion. Um, they want to demonstrate the potential for eco-cargo cycle deliveries from similar hubs across downtown Toronto and in other locations in Canada so this pilot is an opportunity for the city to showcase its leadership in addressing congestion, climate, and safety issues if this, if this is a success and is adopted elsewhere. And so the St. George Mini Logistics Pilot furthers a third goal of the freight and goods movement strategy, which is adaptability. The seventh of the seven goals of the freight and goods movement strategy. Adaptability is the ability to identify, anticipate, and adapt to emerging trends, innovations, and risks. And this is, again, an ex excellent example of collaborative work being undertaken to identify, anticipate, and adapt to emerging trends, uh, innovations, and risks that are affecting the freight and goods movement interesting. So we look forward to this project. We look forward to reporting the results in 18 months. 
and we look forward to future opportunities to support the city in achieving its goals for equitable, sustainable, and prosperous mobility. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for coming. Uh, are there questions of staff on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, speakers on this item. Councillor Layton. If I could, uh, I'll move the staff recommendations and just say that um, this is a really exciting project and really neat, right in the heart of downtown in the middle of the university. Um, my understanding is that they're considering another location as well downtown um, that I look forward to an announcement on uh, in conjunction with electric vehicle charging and a hardwired um, uh, bike share station for recharging the uh, electrified part of the um, uh, of the uh, of the fleet of of, um, uh, of uh, bikes, and so this is uh, like incredibly exciting and and really getting down into trying new things around last mile delivery that could help address some of the congestion on our streets, some of the pollution in the downtown core, uh, as really as, as well as allow for um, the, uh, the the delivery of goods. So very good work to, uh, to staff and to others involved in the project. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Layton. Additional questions? Okay, uh, seeing none, we can vote on the item. All those in favor? All those opposed, uh, that item carries. Uh, our next item is uh, Western Waterfront Master Plan. Um, we have three speakers on this, so we can probably get through one before lunch, and then we'll do a couple quick releases on 30.7 and 30.18, because um, there's no uh, speakers on this item. So uh, our first speaker is on 30.15 Western Waterfront Master Plan is Marianka Bishop Kovac with the Humber Bay for All. Marianka, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you you have five minutes. Oh, um, I was just going to say, could I also speak with Charles Risher? Uh, sure, you have 20 minutes. All right, perfect. Um, Sorry, 10, 10, 10. <laughs> they all just, they all just jumped through their arms at me. Apologies. So yes, you can both speak one after each other and that's a total of 10 minutes. And thank you for people for catching that. Perfect. And then uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one moment. Wait, what am I sharing? Oh. All right, could you let me know if you can see my screen? We can see it. Okay, I'm just gonna enter into presentation mode. Um, I just got a message from uh, the person I'm co-presenting with and I think they need to be unmuted. Hello? I think they've unmuted Charles as well. Go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Charles, are you there? I'm there. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm going to enter full screen mode. All right. Can we start our time now? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Risher, and I'm here with Marianka Bishop Kovac on behalf of the West End Beaches Stakeholders Association, also known as WEBSA. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the Infrastructure and Environment Committee, members and chair, uh, city staff for all their excellent work on the Western Waterfront Master Plan Update Report, and Councillor Gord Perks for requesting a status update on the Western Waterfront Master Plan. We acknowledge that the land within the boundaries of the Western Waterfront Master Plan is located on the traditional territory of many nations and is now the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, Hence, as the Western Waterfront Master Plan moves forward, it is imperative that we enter a pre-consultation phase with the Mississaugas of the Credit and other Indigenous community groups. We need to celebrate the significance of the Humber and the Carrying Place Trail as important Indigenous heritage sites in the City of Toronto. 
WEBSA is a community stakeholders group composed of several recreational boating clubs that call the Western Waterfront our home. The WEBSA group was formed by community stakeholders in 2005 in anticipation of the 2006 Dragon Boat World Championship product, a project pardon me, that saw a 600 meter section of break wall built higher and moved out further into the lake, providing an unparalleled level of shoreline protection. The WEBSA group has continued to meet quarterly since its inception to advocate for and provide stewardship of the Western Waterfront. The Humber Bay for All initiative was developed by a subcommittee of the WEBSA organization, necessitated by the vast challenges that all Western Waterfront users face due to the dilapidated aging break wall infrastructure that was engineered to stand for only 50 years, but has been in place for over 110. The Humber Bay for All subcommittee set out to engage in an in-depth look at break wall designs and resilient shoreline features so that the entirety of the Western beaches could be afforded the same protections as the Maryland Bell Park water course. We're here today because we wanna pledge our support for the revitalization of the 2009 Western Waterfront Master Plan and to illustrate that an updated vision of the Western Waterfront must include resilient shoreline protection in the form of a robust break wall that will provide safe recreational access for our community and all residents of the City of Toronto. Humber Bay for All is excited to support a modernized vision for the Western Waterfront Master Plan that will take a comprehensive view of needs of all the users of the Western Beaches. The existing condition of the break wall must be addressed and, re and the reinvigoration of the Western Waterfront Master Plan represents an incredible opportunity for this to happen. The Western Beaches Break Wall is an essential asset that protects the Humber Bay's critical infrastructure and public amenities along the shoreline. Everyday WEBSA members see firsthand the need for a resilient shoreline strategy in the revitalization of the Western Waterfront Master Plan and in the name of public safety. There is great congestion on the waterway, inside the break wall and on the Martin Goodman Trail, as thousands of Torontonians and visitors frequent the Western beaches on a daily basis. Despite the high E. coli levels that prevent any of the three Western beaches from being granted blue flight beach designations, and the insufficient north and south trail connections and transit and connectivity, interconnectivity, Families continue to gather, picnic, and swim along the Western beaches. We believe that a reinvigorated Western Waterfront Master Plan that puts public safety at the forefront would encourage thousands of more visitors to the Humber Bay every day. It is clear that the effects of climate change are on the present with higher summer temperatures, flooding, and infrastructure damage due to rising water levels as well as greater frequency and intensity of storms. During the 2011 and 2019 high water episodes, Lake Ontario, the Humber Bay, and the Western beaches experienced the impact of larger waves that further eroded the shoreline and threatened the already vulnerable breakwater infrastructure. Western beaches have become a magnet for non-motorized watercraft. Um, the Western beaches have become a magnet for non-motorized watercraft kids' instructional camps, cold water swimmers, and outdoor enthusiasts, all of whom deserve a safe and accessible recreational environment that enhances that an enhanced break wall structure would afford. The 2009 master plan acknowledges the deteriorating state of the existing break wall that was built in 1912, and 13 years later, the condition of this piece of critical infrastructure has only worsened. We believe that a sufficient break wall structure can contribute to the protection of the environment, combat siltation, create habitat for wildlife, help diffuse the Humber plumage and high coli levels in the water, and support the city's 40% tree canopy pool by providing proper shoreline protection. Humber Bay for All knows that after being dormant for the past decade, the Western Waterfront Master Plan can be updated and implemented to improve the Western beaches. We have seen the city's partners like the TRCA and Waterfront Toronto make the investment in other waterfront projects like Port Union, Mimico Boardwalk, the Portlands, and Central Waterfront. 
we want the city to finalize their vision for the Western beaches so that we can leverage any potential opportunities that may emerge during the province's revitalization of Ontario Place. We are confident that the city can find synergies with the Western Waterfront Master Plan. The COVID-19 pandemic was a countrywide reminder that vitality, physical education and wellness are integral components of our lives and our mental health. The public want for green space and connections with the natural world has never been higher. The pandemic was a reminder to the people in Toronto of the value of parks for year round recreation and that our waterfront is, a, is an extremely special resource for those residents across the city that don't have a backyard or the luxury of a cottage. Over the past two years, the Humber Bay for All subcommittee has invested a significant amount of time to expand our network by participating in meetings with stakeholders and interested groups. We've met with many political representatives from all levels of government. We've met with private foundations, with um, city historians, with the mayor's office and community groups um, alike. WEBSA held two very successful community information sessions in 2017 and 2018, one at the Argonaut Rowing Club and the other at the Withrow Common on the CNE grounds, which featured Jennifer Keysmat's Keys Matt, pardon me, <clears throat> hundreds of it residents uh, that shared our vision for a safe and accessible Western waterfront participated, giving us the catalyst to create the Humber Bay for All initiatives. Our efforts in 2021 culminated with the presentation uh, or a presentation to the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority Board on October 22nd, at which the board voted to unanimously endorse the Humber Bay for All initiative. We are optimistic that in 2022, we will continue to build increasing support for the revitalization of the Western waterfront. A resilient shoreline is essential to the success of the Western Waterfront Master Plan. The break wall should be on the foreground of the re, uh, the, or short, in the foreground of the reinvigoration of the Western Waterfront Master Plan, because without dealing with offshore structural support, all the onshore infrastructure and natural shoreline are at risk. Therefore, the incredible initiatives outlined in the Western Waterfront Master Plan that include improvements to public amenities, transportation, infrastructure, and open green space for our community will all be at risk. The need for a resilient Western Waterfront shoreline has not changed in over 100 years, as evidenced by this image uh, of a Toronto Harbour Commissioner's development map. We hope that you agree with us that the Western Waterfront is a significant public asset that needs an enhancement as part of the revitalized master plan. Thank you again to the chair and members of the, park, uh, of the Parks and Infrastructure and Environment Committee for your time today. We look forward to working with the City of Toronto to modernize the Western Waterfront Master Plan and are excited to see what solutions can be found to protect the Western beaches and greatly enhance our community for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputy? <laughs> Apologies. I don't have a screen right now of those of you that are virtual. So if you do have questions, just unmute yourself. Uh, again, questions of councillors? Councillors have questions for deputants? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you to the deputants. Uh, we will dispense of the last of those two items and then we'll go for lunch. So we'll stand this item down. After lunch, um, Alison Stewart will be up and then we have items uh, 30.16, 30.17 to deal with. So IE 30.7 Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy. Councillor Cole, you have a motion to introduce? Okay, we'll display it. Midtown. Okay, this is a motion for Midtown. A beautiful, marvelous Midtown. Uh, one, City Councilor reiterate a support for addressing the community infrastructure needs, including parks, community centers, et cetera, 
in the young Edmonton community and request that the city staff um, use the Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy to focus efforts on addressing this critical deficit expeditiously, including allocating the necessary capital funding required for these projects to achieve complete communities. Two, City Council direct the appropriate city staff to undertake a robust and broad community consultation and communications process as the Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy moves forward, including as part of development review and ongoing city-led projects. That's my motion on uh, IE 30.7. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, move to the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? On the motion, that passes. On the item as amended, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item passes. Uh, the other item, we had introduced 30.18, uh, report on pervious planting spaces on private property. We left it displayed so we could come back to a vote after. Hopefully everybody's seen that. Um, can we move to a vote on this item now? Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed, uh, that item carries. Um, I suggest we go for, uh, hold on. Okay, uh, we can squeeze in one more speaker, um, but I don't know if there's gonna be questions. So we can do five minutes for the speaker and then break. Uh, Allison, are you still in line? I am. Great. Uh, you have five minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello. I'm here on behalf of Cycle Toronto as their senior advocacy manager and as a resident of Ward 13. One of the main reasons that I began working for Cycle Toronto, and in fact have been volunteering for them since 2013, is to help the city and its residents reimagine their views and perceptions of the public realm and to discover the affordability, practicality, and enjoyment of getting around by bike. As we all had to adjust to life during the pandemic, one of the benefits of being on various versions of lockdown has been the discovery of our park spaces and nature trails. Many people didn't take advantage of these wonderful spaces prior to having their activities limited. This paired with the wildly successful city's initiative and innovative active TO program has made the, wa the Western waterfront more popular and widely used than ever before. The Western waterfront is one of the most popular destinations for people of all ages and abilities. In addition to the myriad recreational, social and sporting options the waterfront offers, the corridor represents an opportunity to improve the safety and access to the growing number of people walking, jogging, biking, e-biking and other micro-mobility devices that people are using for a direct east-west route in and out of the city. The Western Waterfront should be a place where people can move safely and enjoy everything that a park offers. Clean air, space to move, and tranquility. You have probably already heard about the tragic incident that took place last week. A person riding their bike on the Martin Goodman Trail was seriously injured by a driver who veered off Lakeshore Boulevard through a metal barrier at a dangerous speed. In 2017, no one can forget the tragic death of five-year-old Xavier Morgan, who was killed while riding his little bike beside Lakeshore. Lakeshore West is a roadway that is inherently and fundamentally dangerous by design. Instead, it should be a street that reflects its proximity to one of Toronto's most popular destination parks on the lake. It should not be an alternative highway. Everyone is invested in making this lakeside space as great as it can be. And at the end of the day, we would like to see people being prioritized over motor vehicle traffic and parking spaces. We simply don't need a six to eight lane road next to the Gardner Expressway and the Queensway. We need a waterfront street that is traffic calmed and safe for everyone. That said, we are requesting that the Western Waterfront Plan adopt short and long-term measures that will improve the safety and quality of life of residents. By reducing traffic speed, implementing traffic calming measures and repurposing two curb lanes to create a protected bi-directional bike lane using crash proof Jersey barriers to create space and separation for people walking and biking and people driving on the lakeshore. 
Exploring weekend road closures wherever possible on weekends in the summer to create an all ages and abilities quiet space on our waterfront. And we are also asking that Lakeshore West be a complete street as part of the long term Western waterfront master plan. These recommendations support the findings of the City of Toronto's active TO report, the city's vision zero strategy, the ambitious transform TO, Toronto Public Health's roadmap to health and economic recovery and rebuild plan, all of which seek to ensure equity of access, safety and mobility for all road users. We are as hopeful as we are confident that these concerns can be addressed in the coming year through continued collaboration to ensure that the Western Waterfront Master Plan update will be a success for the future. Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. I'll ask if there's any questions of the deputant. We may have to deal with them after lunch, but at least then we could know if you're on the hook after lunch. Are there any questions for this deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you so much for uh, giving your deputation. Allison, that completes the deputations on this item. So when we return after lunch, uh, we will uh, go to questions of staff on 30.15. Okay, thank you. What time do we come back? We come back at 1.30. What do
Councilor Peruta and or uh, Deputy Mayor Manan Wong or Councilor Layton. Hi there, Councilor Layton. Hi. Okay, we're live. Uh, so before we return to IE 30.15, a uh, couple items of housekeeping. Uh, Councillor Layton, I understand you have an item to introduce. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for your efforts over the lunch break. Uh, this is in regards to getting a staff report on um, active TO installations in Lakeshore West. Just an update from staff about the criteria and the, um, the challenges with hosting them uh, due to other factors as well as potentially um, other interventions that can help achieve the same. Okay, thank you. So we'll just vote on introducing the item. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, the introduction of that item carries. Uh, Councillor Cole, I understand that I did not call for speakers on item IE 30.7 Midtown Infrastructure Implementation Strategy, but I did call on you for your motion. So you'd like to reopen that item so that you could say a few words about it? Yes, but maybe better give staff a warning because I was going to ask planning staff okay. uh, uh, to uh, basically uh, Greg Lintern. Uh, so maybe we'll just hold it back a bit. And uh, did we do questions already on this item? I thought it was just no. Answers. We didn't do questions we didn't. either. Yeah, so that's okay, why. so we'll just vote to reopen the item, and then uh, maybe the city clerk can follow up them to make sure they're ready. Okay, so all those in favor of reopening the item. I'll suppose that item is uh, opened, and uh, thank you for. Uh, bringing that to my attention. Okay, so that brings us back to the agenda. So we were item 30.15, we completed the deputation, so we're now on questions of staff. Uh, outside councillors first, I know Councillor Perks, you're with us. Did you have questions of staff? No, thank you, Madam Chair, I just wanna speak. Okay, uh, are there any questions from committee? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, outside speakers first. Councillor Perks, five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, this this report uh, is actually uh, a critical report for the City of Toronto. If you think about it, any city in North America would die for the opportunities that we have. A huge, huge stretch of uh, lakefront property uh, on fresh water uh, that as yet is incomplete. And what we did when the waterfront master plan was approved over a decade ago was to come up with a list of quick actions and longer term pieces of work. You'll see in the appendix uh, something like a dozen quick actions that have been taken already, largely based on uh, a couple of key principles. One, to increase uh, the north-south access for people who bizarrely uh, would live a block away from the waterfront but would have to walk 45 minutes through a roundabout way to get there. We've added new pedestrian crossings, new traffic lights and, and essentially made access to the waterfront from the north uh, by means other than cars more possible. We've also uh, added a lot of new cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. It used to be that you took your life in your hands if you tried to figure out how to get from uh, King and, and Jameson uh, down onto the water. You would have to make several illegal and unsafe crossings uh, across the lake shore and on ramps to the gardener and so on and so forth. So we've, we've made huge improvements there. The third thing was to improve the water quality for the, the beaches out there. Uh, time was that those beaches were pretty much always closed to swimming because of uh, a variety of different factors, some of which we have overcome, some of which we still have work to do on. But the big move was transforming what is a, has been a, a rail highway corridor into a transportation network and series of public spaces that privilege those of us who want to be able to enjoy the fact that we live next to uh, one of the Great Lakes. And that requires uh, review, reviewing where we are with the Waterfront West Lake Rail Program. 
it requires uh, reviewing where we are with plans to electrify the, the Lakeshore East goal line, or rather the Lakeshore West goal line. It requires looking at changing several of the bridges and on and off ramps. And it requires moving the Lakeshore and turning it into a city street so that we gain 40 hectares of new parkland and uh, a pedestrian cycling transit accessible western waterfront. City staff have agreed to go and start reviewing that work, to start the consultations on that work, to start figuring out uh, what the big moves are going to have to be and what they're going to cost and what approvals we're going to need. It's a, a really important piece of work, but it is frankly the biggest single opportunity in the City of Toronto right now to get uh, something really important, really right. So uh, hats off and kudos to the, the staff who've worked on this and, and will be working on this over the next six months and probably the next for the foreseeable future. Thanks to them and uh, I commend this report to you and, and hope that uh, it gets adopted without controversy. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any additional speakers? Okay, uh, seeing none, we can call the vote on this item. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. Uh, that brings us to item 30.16, interim report for the High Park Movement Strategy. We have deputants on this item. Uh, the first speaker, or sorry, the, the only speaker registered is uh, Michael Longfield with the Midweek Cycling, Cycling Club. Michael, do we have you on the line? Uh, Michael, are you on the line? Okay. He was there earlier, but we don't see him now. Okay, why don't we proceed to questions of staff on this item? Questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, speakers on this item? Councillor Perks? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is uh, a really important piece of work, too. Uh, it seems to be Ward 4 important work week here at uh, the Infrastructure Committee. High Park has evolved uh, in a very hodgepodge fashion. And as a result, there have been a whole lot of conflicts. You've probably all seen the footage of a, a car chasing a cyclist and, and very nearly seriously injuring him. You've probably heard about uh, the conflicts between uh, people trying to get in to see the cherry blossoms. You probably, I, I know I did, I've received petitions from uh, several thousand people concerned about the conflicts between uh, people who go there to for racing cycling purposes and pedestrians. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And there's never been a coherent thought given to how we manage all of this. Earlier today, you also heard about the, the ravine report and how informal pedestrian paths are causing tremendous erosion in our ravines. The same is true here. So uh, three years ago, we started a conversation about how we can review how all of the different pieces of transportation work in High Park and in, importantly, how Parkside Drive, where there was the terrible fatality of, of Mr. and Mrs. Ferreira uh, almost a year ago now. That, what you have in front of you is uh, a request from staff to be told to go and, and expand that consultation with some rough ideas, some rough designs, so that we can keep all of that work moving forward. There are wonderful, wonderful possibilities here. Uh, we've just heard from the TTC, for example, that during the weekend closures to cars, the TTC will be running a bus through High Park with a number of stops at key locations so that people who are, uh, you know, have limited mobility will be able to enjoy all of the different amenities in the park. We're looking at uh, 
all kinds of innovative stuff from parks in the United States and the United Kingdom for you know opportunities to really take advantage of the possibilities in High Park. And we've centered uh, the conversation with the Mississaugas of the Credit and, and other Indigenous uh, voices in the City of Toronto, as well as the possibility of important renaturalization opportunities in the park and the Black Oak Savannah there. So once again, uh, a very important piece of work that's been years in the making. And again, I commend it to you and, and hope that it can go through without controversy. Okay, thank you, Councillor Perks. Uh, any additional speakers on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll call the question on this one. So IE 30.16, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Uh, that thank you very much all. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to IE 30.17, single use and takeaway items reduction strategy voluntary measures program launch. We have five speakers on this item. The first one is Emily Alfred. Emily, are you in line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Emily. You have five minutes. Great. Thank you. Um, Dear, or good morning or good afternoon, councillors. Thank you for having me uh, here to speak again on another issue. Um, as I mentioned, T is an environmental nonprofit organization. We've been advocating for zero waste policies and programs for over 30 years. I'm here to urge you to continue Toronto's progress to address single use items and move our, our city towards a waste free, resilient circular economy. Single use plastics and takeaway products are a serious and growing problem from plastic pollution um, in our air, water and soil and the problems with recycling to the upstream impacts of fossil fuel extraction and plastic production on our health and environment. Toronto City Council voted to take action on this growing waste, waste crisis more than two years ago. Multiple extensive public and stakeholder consultations confirm that the strong majority of Torontonians support local regulations for the worst materials. The consultations that happened in 2018 and 2019 broke records for consultation with the city in terms of participation. And independent polls across, in Toronto and across Canada have shown that the broad majority of Canadians want to see governments take action on single-use plastics. Unfortunately, we're disappointed that the single-use and takeaway items reduction strategy has stalled despite this broad support from council and the public. A year ago, almost to the day, I spoke to this committee excited at the stage one voluntary measures program that staff had outlined, a comprehensive program that would provide support for businesses to reduce waste voluntarily. We were also thrilled to see a commitment by council to have the city lead by example, adopting all voluntary measures in city facilities and on city property. Unfortunately, despite the ongoing work by staff, the ongoing public support and the growing interest in reducing waste and shifting to reusable alternatives, both by major chains and by small businesses in Toronto, progress from, progress from City Council has stalled. We urge you to keep up the momentum on this file. Let Toronto residents and businesses know that the City will follow through on its commitments to address single-use items. To do so, we have the following recommendations. Number one, move quickly with the Voluntary Measures Program to provide guidance and support for businesses to shift away from waste and save money. Um, as you know, federal regulations on single-use plastics and banning six single-use items specifically are, are, will be passed later this year, and there will be increasing demand from the public, uh, making many restaurants and food service businesses look at how they can reduce waste to respond to those new regulations and public demand. The city can play a critical role supporting businesses to make that shift away from single-use to low-cost reusables. Businesses are seeking guidance and information right now. The city can help reduce uncertainty and risk, especially for small businesses that don't have as much support as the major chains do, as they make decisions on what kind of packaging to buy, for example, avoiding things like uh, compostable plastics, which aren't compostable in the city system, and helping them understand how they can adjust their operations. Uh, you'll actually hear from another speaker today. We'll be talking about some of the research that T and University of Toronto researchers found and heard from small businesses across the city who are looking for that kind of support. We also think the city needs to lead by example in publicly funded facilities and at city events. The city has a really important leadership role to play in helping promote and demonstrate waste reduction activities. Last year, council unanimously committed to leading by example to save the city money and reduce waste by implementing all of the promoted voluntary measures in city facilities. 
Council has previously committed to reducing single-use plastics in city facilities as well. It's important to follow through on those commitments. And finally, we don't think the city can stop with the voluntary measures. We need mandatory measures to follow in 2023. While leading by example and supporting businesses to voluntarily make these waste reductions is important and things that need to start right away, this is just the beginning. To truly reduce single use items and shift our city towards low cost reusable alternatives, we need mandatory measures and regulations. We've seen that there is support from the public on this. Toronto was looking at this just a few months ago. There was talk about the city passing regulations to reduce single use items. And we've seen in other jurisdictions that regulations are very effective at helping businesses make that shift. Toronto staff and council have made great progress on this file. We need you to keep up the momentum to move towards a circular economy and a city based on reusables where food and drinks are served on real dishes when you dine in. When you, go, when you can bring your own container or borrow a reusable cup for takeout. We've seen growing interest in this and excitement for the shift in Toronto. I urge you to support the motion from councillors Layton and Robinson to provide this much needed update and assure Torontonians that council is committed to moving forward with this strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next deputant is Erica Reyes. Erica? Okay, I was not able to unmute myself. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to actually share uh, my screen, if I'm allowed to. Thank you very much. Okay, amazing. Hi, my name is Erica Reyes. I'm the founder and CEO of Inuit, a startup that is inspiring Torontonians to take climate action by enjoying their takeout without waste. Eight years ago, we all at Inuit became environmentalists by accident after watching a documentary about plastic pollution. The documentary was showing a picture of a little seabird full of single-use plastics. Every single piece was colorful and branded. In a moment, we, we could recognize each of them. We made the commitment to reduce our single-use plastic consumption, but we didn't know it was just the beginning of our sustainability journey. Today, we take our impact very seriously. Our clothes are secondhand, we buy our groceries without packaging, and we have given, given up meat just to reduce our impact. They are calling us conscious consumers, and the trend is growing. Actually, 70% of Canadians claim to be a conscious consumer. However, 52% of them claim to don't understand where to start. That's why we are creating Inuit, to inspire our more people, more Antonians, to take climate action and uh, feel great about it. We started to realize that when we take out, we have a mix of emotions. In one side, we feel excited because we love supporting local restaurants and their delicious food. But in the other side, we feel anxious and concerned about all the unnecessary waste in our takeout. And we are not alone. 67% of Canadians that have used a food app feel the same way. This is a huge environmental issue in Canada and in the world. Together, we are generating over 1 billion disposable containers annually across Canada. But it's also a financial problem for restaurants and the city of Toronto. For a mere five minutes of convenience. But what if taking out without waste becomes the getaway for us to reach our net zero goals as a city, as a as citizens, as community? So we are piloting Canada's first zero waste food app. It works very simply. You order and pay online, and you can pick up your food. Your food is served in our beautiful reusable containers. Once returned, 
Um, you have seven days to return your container to any restaurant that is participating in the program. And the faster you do so, the more points you will earn. Every container has an NFC tracking technology, the same technology that we use when we borrow a library book. Uh, once returned by our users, the re our restaurant partners wash, sanitize, and place the container back in circulation, just like regular dishware. <laughs> and uh, it's going really well. Everyone loves the program. Restaurants, community, they all feel uh, part of the change. They feel that we have hope for the future. Uh, so that's why I am here today, representing my community to ask you to please keep moving forward on the single use reduction strategy to help us fill the foundations of the circular economy in Canada. So our nephews, kids, and their kids can also build memories around food. Um, and it, it's very simple what I'm asking today. Uh, so for you to be part of this change also, to support us, to start the voluntary program as soon as possible, to help Toronto's businesses, residents, and, and the government reduce waste to consider a reward system for restaurants that are shifting already to reusable packaging, and to reduce waste in city facilities to show leadership in this important issue. Toronto was, was named one of the greenest cities in North America, and I believe that we have a big responsibilities, responsibility on our shoulders. We have to raise the bar high to show leadership, leadership to become a zero waste city. It will be difficult and challenging, but we can step into the next decade with pride. Um, we can show that the government, citizens, and businesses, we are serious and care about climate change. And Thank you. I believe Final that it will, <laughs> this will help us to reach our goal uh, that we have as a city to reduce 70 to divert 70% of the residential waste from the city of Toronto and it will save money to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation and joining us today. Are there any questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you, Erica. Uh, that will bring us to our next deputant, Rafaela Gutierrez from the University of Toronto Trash Team. Hello, you have five minutes. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, Chair McKelvey and other members of the committee. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to share my expertise on plastic waste with you today and to help facilitate the use of science to inform policy. For the sake of time, I will summarize my position, but I note that uh, my written letter, which includes a research report, provides additional information. I am Dr. Rafaela Gutierrez, a social scientist at the University of Toronto. I am the lead of social science educational programs with my organization, the University of Toronto Trash Team. I have been researching plastic waste for more than a decade with a focus on social, social impacts of plastic waste. At the University of Toronto Trash Team, we conduct, we conduct research, education, and outreach on plastic pollution. Our research on the waterfront shows ubiquitous contamination of plastic pollution, especially single-use plastic items. Our researchers have found hundreds of pieces of plastics in the stomachs of local sport fish. As a parent, this is a concern for, for the health of our uh, kids. Today, I want to talk specifically about Toronto's single-use and takeaway item reduction strategy. I am cur currently leading a research program in collaboration with the Toronto Environmental Alliance to better understand the need for this strategy and ways to implement new policies successfully. We recently completed the first phase of our study to investigate the challenges and opportunities local businesses experience in reducing single-use goodware. 
in phase one of this project, uh, surveys and interviews were conducted with local businesses from across Toronto. Our results inform upstream solutions and are particularly relevant to demonstrate the potential success of the single use and takeaway items reduction strategy. We found that many Toronto food service businesses already consider the environment in their business decisions and are taking steps to reduce single use items. This means there is a demand for policies around single use and takeaway items. Based on our surveys, it was also clear that restaurants and cafes in Toronto want more guidance and support to further reduce single use foodware, including education campaigns to customers, information from the city on the safety of reusable foodware, and consistent municipal policies and programs. This suggests that policies will be successful if they include a mechanism to inform businesses about the value of the program health and safety guidelines and some resources to help them make informed choice about sustainable options for foodware. Policies will also be more successful with an education campaign directed at the public, the customers. Education resources are fundamental, especially as the federal government moves away from some single use items. Education is critical as we want to be sure substitutions won't create more problems. I'm here today because we understand that single use and takeaway items reduction strategy isn't moving forward with the voluntary phase yet to start and stage two delayed. The results of our research and the UFT trash team's finding of leader on our waterfront demonstrate a need for this policy to continue advancing to both reduce plastic pollution in our waterways and to support local businesses. We ask that you, we ask that you either proceed with the next phase as planned or clearly communicate with the public regarding a new timeline to maintain the momentum and critical research, research to ensure a successful program. Business want and will benefit from more guidance and information from the city. The time to act is now and show Canada that our biggest city, Toronto, is a leader. So, Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you, and I would be very happy to answer any question today or in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. May I please speak? Uh, may I please ask if there are any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none. Thank you so much, Rafaela. Uh, that brings us to Donna Marie Batty. Donna, are you on the line? Hello. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, is this yeah, Don, you are. Donna Marie? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry, we had some technical problems here. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. You have five minutes. Okay, I won't take that long. Um, okay, I just want to say I'm a resident of South Etobicoke and I, near, I live very close to Lake Ontario and a five minute walk to get to the lake. And what I see there is the short chain within the lake much much worse um this is our drinking water and equally troubling is that it's a wildlife habitat and the animals are forced to contend with all this plastic um city council has been talking about plastic reduction since at least 2008 and after all this time and study 40,000 people in public consultations petitions non-plastic volunteer groups springing up everywhere. We were met with the city's latest plan that requires businesses to give out uh, only upon request plastic 
and the public voluntarily brings their own refillable containers. Uh, this is this looks to be a plan following the path of least resistance, not the solution to the plastic crisis. Um, presently, every person has the option to voluntarily refuse plastic and it isn't working. So I'm just saying, please bring in strong measures, strong legislation to ban plastic. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna Marie. Um, are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, our final speaker on this item is Leslie Keston. Leslie, are you in line? Okay, uh, we don't see Leslie online. Are there any questions of staff on this item? Okay, any speakers to this item? I'd like to speak for a moment if I could. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and, uh, and, and to the speakers that, that came forward today. Um, the city has done a lot of work and council has given a significant amount of direction to staff to uh, to, to advance the, the, the issue of single use plastic uh, and, and come up with strategies to address it. I think that, that what staff came up with was very reasonable um, with a voluntary rollout uh, consistent with the federal program and then a, a more, more regulatory um, regime that uh, filled in the blanks of what, what the federal program would, uh, would be missing. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen that the, the, the implementation of, the, uh, or notwithstanding the approval from council, the implementation has been delayed for the voluntary measures. Um, I've been giving a briefing, been given a briefing, as several of you may have, uh, about the reasons for that. Um, I think that uh, that the rationale is insufficient uh, for uh, for us to proceed, and and I think it's it, it it warrants having some public discussion about this and the public understanding what the rationale is. Uh, at this stage with not uh, proceeding with this. Like this, just a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, if you'll remember, this was one of the top pressing issues our federal government was looking at and, and, in, and in our communities. And I think it's, it's evident with the number of motions that have come forward uh, from council for us to look at this and start to address some of these issues. Um, yes, there are other policies that will implement what the city can and can't do or can, needs to do and, and what is already being done. Um, but I think the delays uh, and uh, seems to be just putting off some inevitable pieces. And, and one in particular is the voluntary rollout. We need to give tools to businesses so that they can uh, work with their clients uh, and, uh, and, and reduce the plastic, their, the single use plastic that they're producing. It's, I think, very easy. It's not particularly onerous. I don't think that COVID is a good reason to, de to, to delay that. And then the recovery is a good reason to delay simple voluntary measures. Uh, and so that's why we put the, the motion uh, before you today. I think, I think we need to, 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 to really um, make public what has been discussed with some of the councillors privately uh, in order for us to have a public dialogue about the delay in implementation uh, of this strategy. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there any additional speakers on this item? Okay, I just want to. Yeah, yeah ma 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 Madam Speaker Peruzza, if I yeah. can just, you know, a couple of words. Okay. Peruzza, yeah, where have you been? Uh, right here, <laughs> following and listening. Um, uh, so listen, uh, you know, uh, some uh, 10 years ago, uh, we had an opportunity to sort of test the laws in court. We you know, council took what was then uh, sort of a, a bold, radical uh, uh, initiative uh, to, to basically try and pass a bylaw, uh, rather weak, because it was a compromise bylaw, uh, to, ban, uh, a single, uh, to ban plastic bags. Um, you know, the industry, uh, as, uh, as people will recall back then, um, it took our bylaw uh, to, to court, challenged that and basically uh, had it thrown out and basically said, you know, uh, municipalities, uh, City of Toronto, uh, under its current rules, doesn't have the, the power 
uh, to to uh, you know to take on such a measure and and do this thing. Um, I have to tell you, I, you know, the uh, was it a couple of weeks ago? Um, I organized a, a cleanup behind the North York Sheridan Mall uh, along the Black Creek uh, in my uh, in my ward. And uh, we got together, uh, you know, a group of volunteers, and um, and went into the ravine just before just before the ravine was about to fill in with foliage and and greenery. Uh, and I have to tell you, it was absolutely disgusting. Uh, the amount of plastic entwined in shrubs and trees along the creek. Uh, it was it was just like you, you just you couldn't you know haul it all out of there because it was caked on you know uh, one bag one garbage bag one shopping bag one little bag uh, you know cups all kinds of like plastic stuff on top of each other uh, it was mind-numbingly disgusting uh, the uh, you know the the level of of stuff that was in there now as you all know the Black Creek, uh, you know, during uh, um, uh, rain events, um, fills in very quickly and rises very quickly. Um, so, you know, uh, every time uh, that creek rises, it picks up all that plastic and God knows where it hauls it off. Uh, uh, but I know it just, it just lives on forever. Uh, and it's strangling our environment, it's strangling nature, uh, and uh, soon enough, it'll strangle all of us if we don't do something about it. It was shameful, uh, the fact that when we went to court on this, uh, that our laws were so weak in this area uh, that municipalities had no capacity whatsoever, you know, to put a dent in, in, in this, uh, uh, in, in the reduction or the elimination of uh, the single-use plastics uh, in our environment. Uh, and, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that, that our governments have, you know, in the past decade have come along much further in, in this regard. But somebody's got to ring their bell and got to ring their bell hard um, on this because otherwise uh, we're all doomed. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, for the opportunity to... Uh, I uh, just contribute a few words to this conversation. Okay, thank you, Councilor Prutza. Any other speakers on this item? Okay, seeing none, I have a technical amendment from the clerk, just changing to the word um, that the general manager solid waste management services provides the update. Um, that's the only minor change to that. Uh, so uh, thank you to uh, everybody for their participation in this item today. I do just want to point out the staff have advised me uh, when I did see this item, they let me know that they are rolling out the voluntary measures program in June. Uh, so I think that we'll be pleasantly surprised around that, that it's rolling out. So we'll be able to get an update on, uh, you know, what the program does entail and uh, how the role, how the, um, how the issue, uh, sorry, the item uh, rolled out and how that got started in June. So with that, uh, if there's no other speakers, uh, we'll call the question. All those in favor? I was opposed, that item carries. Okay, we, oh, I amended it. Okay, all those in favor as the item as amended. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. Uh, we do need to reopen another item again. Um, we need to reopen the High Park item, which is, what's the number? Item 16. Uh, unfortunately, there was a deputant that did register properly, but did not display on the speaker's list. Uh, so we'll just vote to open that item so that we can hear from the deputant and uh, apologize to him for uh, this technical error and uh, hear from him. So all those in favor of reopening the item? All those opposed, that carries. Uh, do we have Sonam Vashith on the line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for joining us and our apologies about that. Go ahead, you have five minutes. No, no worries. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, councillors. Thank you for... I'm, uh, I'm Sonam, I'm the engagement coordinator at Cycle Toronto, and I'm here to support and make recommendations for the High Park Movement Strategy. 
As we know, we've seen a huge increase in walking and cycling since the pandemic began with people looking to stay active and socialize during uh, using our parks and green spaces. While High Park itself is a beautiful and a peaceful place to spend time, the number of fatalities and injuries caused by motor vehicles in and around High Park, um, it is important that Vision Zero and Complete Streets Lens is applied to the High Park movement strategy, including Parkside Drive. We are supportive of the strategies included in this report to improve safety on Parkside Drive and to improve accessibility and safety inside High Park, including a DEC or private vehicle that will help people with mobility issues move inside the park while maintaining a car free environment. Oh, sorry about that. In addition to the measures proposed, we would like city staff to consider the following. Uh, number one, expand transit access to the park beyond the weekend. In order for the park to be safe and accessible to all and to encourage active mobility, we would like to see the expansion of transit services to all days of the week beyond the current pilot program. This could be through TDC access or through an accessibility friendly uh, vehicle with, within the park, which replaces the current diesel train. Number two, we would also like to see dedicated cycling space within the park and allocated time for recreational cyclists to train. This would reduce conflicts between people traveling at different speeds throughout the park. For example, this could also, uh, there could be uh, people permitted to bike above a posted, above the posted speed limit between a certain time, for example, 5.30 to 7.30 a.m. Uh, number three, for the proposed design changes for safety improvements on Parkside Drive, we would urge the city to adopt a design which maintains no more than two motor vehicles, make two motor vehicle travel lanes, um, ensures dedicated protected space for people walking and cycling, including sidewalk space on both sides uh, of Parkside, um, and one that retains parking on the east side of, uh, of the street for residents. Uh, and also provide the safe connection and, and crossing for active travel on Parkside Drive at the Garden Expressway underpass, as this route serves as an important connection to the Lakeshore Avenue and Martin Goodman Trails. We recommend that the transportation services explores opportunities to speed up the implementation, which may include active DO temporary cycle track implementation measures, but this also should include a safe crossing under the Garden Expressway as an important, as important part of rapid implementation. Uh, we are confident that with these considerations, we can encourage people to choose walking, cycling, and transit to and through a high park, and they can have a truly safe and enjoyable experience doing so. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and uh, and uh, uh, waiting for us to receive your, your deputation. Uh, there is a question for you from Council Perks. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for that. Uh, a lot of what you said are things that, that I've been hearing too. Do you have that uh, written down somewhere, what you just said? Yes, I do. I, we actually submitted a letter to um, on this item as well. Okay, um, and, and yes, all yes. of your ideas were captured in that letter? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, it was, good. Yeah, it was uh, submitted on behalf of our senior advocacy manager, Alex Stewart. So it won't be under my name, it will be on Stewart's name. Ah, uh, okay. No, I've okay. I, I was actually talking to Allison this morning. Um, okay. okay, great. So I'll just I'll forward that to the consultation staff who are working both inside the park and on Parkside. Thanks for coming out today. That was okay. Of course. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Madam Chair, point of order. Since the item is reopened, I'm wondering whether we could uh, vary procedures and and uh, ask questions of staff. Uh, I didn't in the first round. I've been advised that if it's open, it's open. So I, I would ask that you be brief um, on that. Okay, go ahead. Great, thank you. I hope staff are still around. So I just wanted clarity on the report we're looking at here. So on, on page 12 and throughout, um, the city is, is, is going through with weekend and holiday uh, road closures. But at the same time, we hear a lot about complete streets. Now, complete streets is a design element for pedestrian and cycling safety, but it also allows for traffic flow. So just for clarity's sake for the public, is it is it road closures or is it a new design of roads to allow traffic flow, pedestrian flow and cycling flow?
To the speaker, Councillor Pasternak, you're asking about Parkside Drive, yes? Yeah, I mean, I'm on page 12 of your report, and it's clearly... Yeah, I'm sorry, I... Yeah. I, I, I lost track of where we were in the yeah. agenda. To so be I, I okay. hear complete streets program, which allows for traffic flow, and I hear closures. Uh, could you just reconcile the two, please? Well, the, the High Park study is looking at the roads in High Park, uh, looking at uh, some closures, uh, time of day and, and weekend closures there, but also uh, an assessment of Parkside Drive. So we've combined um, some of the... Um, routes that are adjacent to High Park and looking at um, some of the safety related issues there and working uh, with the local community, coming up with some options at a very early, early stage right now at a conceptual level for some complete streets improvements along Parkside Drive. So uh, there's no determination about specifically what's going to happen there yet, but we have a number of conceptual ideas that we're working through and there'll be a lot more engagement and consultation that needs to happen before we move forward with any of them. And I'll uh, hand it over to Janie if she wants to talk about anything more in the park itself. No, through the chair, I, I, uh, I, I think um, Barbara has said it all. I mean, there's two different approaches. One is Parkside Drive and, uh, and the approach that Barbara is talking about. We're also talking very specifically about the road structures within the park which you know is, is a different sort of thing but how they're connected to parkside drive is where the two come together so would you describe the, the road closures as um an interim measure that's to be monitored uh through, through i mean that's through the through the chair that's what the report indicates i think you know we've had through uh the last few years some very successful uh approaches with the road closures i think we've also had a number of um you know uh, other approaches and other considerations that have come forward and i think you know what's proposed in the report is to continue doing that work and to look into uh, more consultation as well as uh, a number of other strategies to look at you know what some permanent solutions can be within the park right now all the structures and all the road co closures are, are are temporary on weekends only okay thanks for that clarity okay thank you any additional questions Anybody like to speak to this item? Okay, uh, no speakers. Uh, uh, we will receive the, receive the report for information. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. Um, thank you everybody for your indulgence with uh, reopening of that item. That brings us back to IE 30.7, another item that we did reopen. Uh, this one is uh, uh, my mistake as I had thought we had done questions of staff on this and we did not. So. Um, uh, go ahead, Councillor Cool. you have questions of staff. Oh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, sorry for this uh, mix up with staff, but I, this is a very important report and I wanna ask staff, uh, I've been asked by some of the community groups interested, what are the plans for continued consultation with uh, residents uh, on these infrastructure projects and this strategy for Midtown? What, plans for some consultation? Uh, through the speaker, uh, it's uh, Greg Dunter and Councillor Cole. Um, we will, uh, of course, we are out uh, often in uh, the Midtown communities uh, consulting on development review applications. And uh, that, of course, will continue. Uh, if you layer in this uh, infrastructure um, uh, implementation strategy, um, we're planning on annual updates. We are uh, planning on five-year updates of, of progress, uh, the alignment with the capital budget. And um, we can certainly avail, oursel avail ourselves of the of our website for Midtown, uh, run public education on infrastructure, keep the community up to date on our progress on infrastructure, and, um, and focus, uh, I think, on, uh, on uh, on, on the, the key message, which is as we pace uh, development and population growth, we must pace uh, infrastructure improvements and uh, we'll be actively engaged in that kind of conversation with the community. This is an ongoing growth management process uh, and we're very mindful of the need to uh, keep the community engaged and plugged into uh, our progress on infrastructure planning. Now in the report, uh, I don't know, these numbers are even astonishing to me, uh, you recommend or you uh, 
projected there's going to be another 93,000 people uh, coming into Midtown uh, uh, by 2051. Uh, that's 20,000 over the uh, estimate just a few years ago. Well, where are all these people coming from? Uh, and uh, wow, uh, how are we going to ever provide services and infrastructure for another 93,000 uh, people? Uh, well, as you point out, uh, Councillor, through the chair, uh, the you know the growth it, it, that is anticipated, the plan up by the plan over the next thirty years is anticipated in part um, with the additional population and density that the province added into the Midtown plan. That being said, we have to continue um, with the work that this infrastructure strategy um, calls for which is coordination of um, all the capital, the good work that all the divisions are doing with capital planning. And, and really this, this report offers an opportunity to uh, provide a, what we're calling a playbook for integrated growth management, where we look at opportunities to coordinate among divisions and, um, and, and all, of the, all of the capital planning that goes on on a five and 10 year cycle with the city and continuously update that. So this is a very focused effort in making sure that we grow and pace the infrastructure changes um, with, with the population growth that's anticipated. Yeah, so this is like a focused uh, uh, infrastructure uh, hub that we're, uh, capital funding hub. Uh, where are we gonna get the money uh, to build uh, added infrastructure for another 93,000 people? Well, again, this is paced out over 30 years. Uh, it, it won't all come at once. Uh, and we are estimating a, uh, a certain amount of, of change in, in five and 10 year increments. Um, but what's important and it's pointed out in the report is that approximately 71% of the planned capital improvements that are called for in the first tranche of capital improvements are already in the capital plan. So that, that is a continuous exercise. We will reassess that constantly on an annual basis and with five-year updates and certainly with the divisions working together, um, try to capture on a continuous basis uh, what is needed in the city's 10-year capital plan. These, these uh, matters are funded through development charges, uh, the new community benefits charge, for example, and the, and the parks levy uh, uh, all three growth funding tools that the city uh, deploys to support uh, growth management. I'm not saying it's going to be easy or straightforward because in an area that is rapidly changing like this, there will uh, constantly be challenges to confront. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Lantern. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kola. Are there any additional questions on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, speakers on this item. Councillor Cole. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, no, I, I think this is uh, of great significance, uh, uh, and I want to thank staff for the work and uh, coordinating this response uh, to providing uh, infrastructure. Uh, and by infrastructure, you know, in the past, people have always talked about well, sewers and roads and transit. Well, this is uh, on top of that. Uh, so because we have the transit infrastructure that's going in with the Eglinton Crosstown, but uh, we need the uh, infrastructure for these uh, 90,000 plus people that are coming into this area right now. Uh, and we need open space because most of these people are gonna be living in very small apartments in the sky, boxes in the sky. So they're gonna need outdoor spaces. They're going to need recreation spaces. They're going to need a library to go to. Uh, so this is way beyond just sewers and uh, transit. And uh, you can just imagine, we we're basically building a city like uh, Peterborough or uh, Barrie inside the Young Eglinton area, on top of what we have there already. Uh, I don't know if uh, we get many tourists from Scarborough to come to uh, the Young Ellington area, but I invite you to come up and uh, walk around with Councillor Robinson and myself and you can uh, tour uh, what we're facing in Midtown. It's a great place. There's a lot of wonderful people, There's a lot of wonderful shops, and but again, 
We are infrastructure deficient right now, parks for instance. Uh, you can imagine trying to go to a park in Midtown. Uh, it is very, very difficult to find a green space in Midtown. With the present population, which is way above the uh, uh, projected uh, population uh, growth uh, area for the province put in, where we surpassed that years ago. So now we're expecting <laughs> another. So that's why this coordination of this infrastructure capital uh, expenditure, which is needed, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, without uh, any exaggeration, uh, it's a crisis. Uh, you can imagine building a city within the city in a little uh, area called Midtown. Uh, so it's a great challenge and I'm glad that the staff coordinated all this information and has focused uh, their attention on building uh, this much needed uh, social community uh, health infrastructure, which is uh, vitally needed to serve the new people coming in to Midtown. And that's beside the usual argument about traffic and uh, congestion, etc. We're way right beyond that. Now we've got to deal with where can people go down to sit on a park bench? You know, you're, you're going to have a hard time doing that because right now our the only park we have there, Eglinton Park, is uh, just filled with the wall-to-wall -wall people. Uh, you know, on Saturday afternoons, uh, try and find a blade of grass there in Eglinton Park, uh, and it's wonderful to see all the kids playing soccer and baseball in the playground, but you know, we need 10 Eglinton parks and we only have one. Uh, so the uh, critical thing here is that there is this attempt at coordinated strategy here to uh, build what is called a complete community. Right now, we just are turning into a total residential community where Young and Eglinton used to be quite a uh, active uh, employment area but it's transforming into nothing but residential. And so we've had a few successes in keeping the employment areas uh, as office space, but we need you know, places for people to go and uh, practice their yoga or uh, play uh, their, their games or just sit in the park. Uh, and, we need, and our schools are all overcrowded. This doesn't even talk about the schools. You can't get into a school, so we you can't get into the schools now. You imagine we're inviting another 93,000 people to go to the schools that are already filled. And we have no new schools on the books. Try and get into Allenby School, uh, try Eglinton School, uh, uh, you know, St. Monica School. You can't get into a school, uh, never mind the high school. So this is an immense challenge that uh, at least the staff is addressing. Uh, and uh, we're going to try and uh, do what we can. I hope they look at all avenues of getting the needed capital dollars to build this infrastructure and somehow create some parkland. We have a few new parkland. And this Saturday, we're actually creating a new park. The Joni Mitchell Concept Park is going to be opened up in a preliminary way. We're unpaving paradise at Castlefield and Eglinton. Used to be a parking lot. It's going to be the Joni Mitchell Music Park, I hope, in the future. But it's been planned as a park now, no longer a condo uh, building. It's going to be a park. So this Saturday at, I think, uh, 1 o'clock, uh, James Pasternak, you're invited to come. Uh, we've got a klezmer band there. Everything uh, happening this Saturday, Castlefield and uh, Young. Welcome. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Cole. Any other speakers on this item? Okay, with that, we'll vote on the item. All those in favor? Uh, oh, do we need to do councillors' motions again? Just uh, as amended. Okay, on the item as amended, just for clarity. Great. Okay. Uh, that leaves us with the last item uh, that Councillor Leighton walked on. Uh, anybody like to hold this item? Or can we proceed to the vote on this? Uh, so, Councillor Pasternak is just asking it to be displayed on the screen. It is on CMP as we introduced it.
Okay, great. Um, I didn't see any questions on the item. Speakers on the item. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. I am going to triple, quadruple check with clerks that we have completed our agenda. Nothing else to reopen? All speakers accounted for? Okay, everything has been accounted for. We have completed the agenda. Great work, everybody. One more meeting left in this term. Great job chairing, Jennifer.